Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast Where we spin the jams and spill the tea today of dean martin <laughs> that was it that was that was, yep that was it uh today yeah. we are going to be talking about this is a new a brand new episode we're going to be talking about two recently released records we are going to be talking about the new album collaborative album from armand hammer and the alchemist we're going to be talking about haram and we are also going to be talking about the brand new album from post-rock Legends, Godspeed, you Black Emperor. We're going to be talking about God's P states and good, good name, good name. Jake has a new book out. A yes, it is a compilation compilation of the Jeez. last. It, it is a compilation of the last five volumes that I have written of my sequel series to Those Who Dwell in the Dark. So if you need to catch up and you want. Avenue and you want that shit on the back, the real nice cover, go check that out because it's super fucking dope and I am excited for people to read it. Um, and coming soon, coming in like two months. Oh my God, holy shit. Yes, yeah, so go and check that out. Another cool thing that is worth shouting out is that the second episode of the Rubber Gum Anime Podcast is now online as well. That, for those of you who may not know, is the anime podcast that is hosted by Jake and August. Yes, that Jake and that August. Uh, they discussed, um, fuck, what was it called? <laughs> Future, Future Diary. Future Diary. Diary. Future Diaries, well, otherwise that's Otherwise right. known in Japanese as Mirai Nikki. Uh, also that's... known as yeah, yeah. Garbage Fire. An anime I watched until seven in the morning. <laughs> the anime Sarah watched with us and like a train wreck, could not pull herself away from it despite mm-hmm. the fact that it was I, uh, five in the morning. I could pull myself away. I wish I we, we we discussed that you tuned in for literally the only three episode long section of the show. It's boring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I feel I feel glad after having seen the episode that that is the <laughs> section. That it's I a watched. journey. It, the episode's a journey. Let I, me tell uh, you, I've never seen a, a a second of Future Diary, but I laugh my ass off at multiple it's, points. It's almost better. Why would you? So don't be afraid to go and check it out. Uh, it's really fun and it's really cool. And we're we all there's also if you missed well, there's a first episode of the Rubber Guy Anime Podcast, which is on uh, the on Ghibli and specifically uh, Kiki's Delivery Service and Earwig, Earwig and the, the Witch. Witch. I, the yeah. worst title, just the worst title. I Everything about that awful. movie is ugly. I, 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 I keep wanting to say Hedwig and the Angry Itch. I'm much yeah. better. Yeah. I oh. mean, it's a good movie. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> anyway, mm. um, so that's we've got lots of stuff happening. So that's exciting. Um, mm-hmm. Also coming up as well, very shortly, we're going to be recording our next uh, full discography episode, which is going to be on the uh, atmospheric black metal band agalock so look out for that that's going to be really exciting and yeah way to sound enthusiastic sorry <laughs> i um for for our listeners benefit i am uh considerably hungover so if, um, if you're doing you a good any, job at faking if, it. if it makes you feel any better i did an interview with the practical effects artist for possessor stonkingly hungover Happy for you. I am, you can it it I achieve am, your dreams while hungover. I am simply never not hungover spiritually. That's so true. All <laughs> I, right, think that's, so, I think that's your core of personality trait, well, Morgan. I and I say that, that with I all the love in the world. I love that Joyce Manure record. Joyce no. Manure? Joyce, Joyce Manure? I hate Manure. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, me. <laughs> Jake, what have you been listening to this week? Oh, what have I been listening to this week? Well, um, uh, Tom Waits, good, good fella. Um, I have recently been swapping this around. This kid's my got t- something. <laughs> <laughs> Might have a future in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I mean, my, my top- released an album for God knows how long. Uh, it has been ten years. Yep. 
Thanks. Tom, please, please. One more. Spare, just, spare just, crumb of album, Mr. Wade. Give a song, please. I, I'll, I'll settle. But um, my top four albums of his have been sliding around for like the past six months just because it's impossible to fucking decide. But I think I finally definitively came down for my Dark Horse favorite because it never at in one point was my favorite Tom Waits album or even really threatened to be it until my last couple listens of it. But I came around on Mule Variations being my favorite just because... I don't know, man, that album's like an hour and 14 minutes long and there's not a single second of it that's a miss. It's just like literally every song is just one of his best. All of it's perfect. All of it is, it, it's just so holistic. It feels like the Tom Waits fans, Tom Waits album, just because it's like, it's all killer, no filler. And it's really fucking long, even though that's the case. So I... <laughs> Uh, it, it, it might not be for everybody, certainly is for me. And two little things is uh, I, myself, Tyler, and Morgan have been working through the discography of the Dillinger Escape Plan, who has just uniformly become one of our favorite uh, bands, like all three of us, just like every single time we listen to a new album, we're just like, yeah, this is this is the best one. This is it. And then we listen to the next one. We're like, <laughs> funny thing about that. And uh, then you have a new favorite one because th these guys are insane people. They are they are actual crazy human beings, and it just their their insanity manifests in audio form. Uh, I, I yeah. can recommend listening to this band if you would like to experience the feeling of having your brain microwaved. Yes, if, if you, I, I, Morgan put it best when he first talked about calculating infinity on this, and he goes, I think he said something along the lines of, I listened to calculating infinity and I felt used afterward. And that is yeah. the best way to describe it is that th those albums take you and they put you to task. And by the end of it, you feel like you just had the, like, the most wild, raucous, painful sex you've ever had in your life. What, and just what? sitting in the afterglow, like, what's oh, so, what's yeah. so, like, what's so, another one. What's so great about them? <laughs> What's so great about this band is that like, they will like give you the heaviest, loudest, most absurd shit in the world. And then like fucking five seconds later, they'll be crooning this fucking hook mm -hmm. that sounds like right out of radio in the early 2000s and shit. One of us is the killer type beat where the first two songs are the most aggressive shit they've ever done. And then the third song comes in and he's just like, Ooh, and you're like, what? what? When you shot your arrow through me. Oh god, I fucking oh, you, I love that song you, you so much. You guys have a way of describing heavy music that's like immediately makes me think of something I know that happened to me that was very painful. And then you say it's like more than that. And um no. <laughs> um, and but like the, the best way to articulate the appeal of the Dillinger escape plan is just like, okay. So imagine if like one of the better Converge albums had like the most wicked square pusher IDM track on it for like no fucking reason. And it was, it was like one of the best ones on the record. It's just like, that's, that, that is, that is why that band is great because that, and that then, will happen. And, and then the song, and then the song after that is like a Converge song for two minutes and then a Mahu Vishnu orchestra song <laughs> for the next two. Exactly. <laughs> yes, what I'm, precisely. What I'm getting at is, is this is the greatest band of all time. And I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not even being hyperbolic when I say that right now. That may just be how I feel. They're, they're, they're getting there with me. I mean, they're, they're, they're certainly up there. And um, last, uh, well, I won't mention, or I will mention, but later when we talk about it, but I, I finally hunkered down and listened to every Godspeed You Black Emperor album just because that was something I had been meaning to do and just never have because I had only listened to a couple of them. And uh, I have to agree with Tyler's assessment from earlier. Uh, I think, I don't know if we ever talked about it on the podcast, but I do remember him saying uh, that uh, Yankee, that that album was like super underrated. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. That is tied for my favorite Godspeed record. I think it's just genuinely outstanding. I actually like it better than F Sharp. And uh, I, I like that album a fair bit. Uh, but yeah, all of their records are, are, are quite good. So that, that but uh, I, have a, I have a thing with them for later when we talk about stuff. And uh, the last thing I'll talk about, I won't even really talk about because I'm sh I am like 80 to 90% certain Sarah's just gonna bring it up. But uh, by complete, complete, Cosmic coincidence. Mm -hmm. We 
somehow started listening to the exact same album at the exact same time as one another this yep. week. Uh, we, we didn't did not talk about it beforehand. <laughs> No, we didn't talk. I, I just threw on a song from it. In fairness, I didn't put on the whole album until I found out she was also listening to it. But uh, mm-hmm. the both of us listened to an album from a band called Dissection called The mm-hmm. Storm of Light's Bane, which is an album that I have I, that I'm just constantly like, li- listen to it. It's it's the Absolute blueprint. Rager. It's it's like I go back to it and I'm just like, I wonder if this is going to hold up now that I've heard like a lot more like black metal and melodic black metal. And like it also has like a lot of progressive tendencies. And you listen to it and you're just like, oh, holy shit. There's that 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 album contains maybe the single most horrifying scream put on any song in that I've ever heard ever. It's like halfway through and instead of like a guitar riff, it just kind of like edges you and then you get this shrill absolutely bone chilling scream and you're just like oh 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 no and and it's it's great it's good yeah like Like the blueprints for extreme music as we know them are like i don't know any given dark throne album of the of what's called the unholy trinity (laughs) um scream bloody gore by death Uh uh-huh Entombed's Left Hand Path oh, um, yes. and Dissections, uh, Storm mm-hmm. of the Light's Bane. And Storm of the Light's like, Bane is the, the best one I've listened to of those. So that's it. I listened to a lot of shit this week. August, uh, what have you been listening to? Zen Arcade by Husker Du, uh, legendary uh, post-hardcore uh, punk band. Uh, their this album's as good as everyone makes it out to be. It's Fucking amazing. Right. Uh, and it ends with like this 15 minute progressive rock adjacent song, and it's the coolest shit. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I like it a fair bit. It's really fun. Uh, next thing, this is a little more off the beaten path. Uh, I listened to uh, Baby Metal's Metal Resistance. Baby Ooh, Metal yeah. being the band that famously fuses uh, Dragon Force guitars. That's not an exaggeration. Literally, the lead guitarist and rhythm guitarist from Dragon Force play uh-huh. on this album with K-pop vocals. And yeah, K-pop I, I saw you listen to this record. It's on... better than Dragon Force. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, seen, I'd seen you'd rated this album, and I was like, I physically cannot picture August listening to this. How did this happen? What were the compliments? You have failed to consider anime. Yeah. <laughs> anime is kind of... But yeah, no, I was. I had always been really, really interested in what this band sounded like. I presumed I was going to hate it, and I thought it was actually kind of fun. I, yeah. it, does, it does kind of occupy this area of my curiosity in this band being a little more than like a... A novelty, I'd say, but there's still mm. it's still an enjoyable record, even if to throw on like one fun novelty. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh it's cool. Next thing, um Dismemberment Plans Emergency <laughs> and I. This is a record I've been listening to a bunch lately. It's of course legendary kind of I say legendary for everything, but it's it's really like definitive late 90s early 2000s indie rock kind of math rock band really fun exciting dance songs really uh mostly really good ballads there's there's a couple tracks in there that i don't think are a hundred percent there but overall it's like still an amazing album that rarely misses it's full of energy you can listen to it and basically any mood and have a have a good time so yeah yeah. it's one of they're one of those bands um i mean like for instance dillinger escape plan where you can their best stuff sounds like nothing else you can't get it anywhere else from any other band it's just it's just completely idiosyncratic uh which is um i think the best way i could probably you gotta uh, combine like well, five separate disparate bands to get like anywhere approximating how to describe their sound. Yeah, basically. Good album. 
Yeah, and that's not something I would try to do off the top of my head. Uh, final thing. Um, uh, another really iconic um, outsider music record I listened to recently, Rocky Erickson and the Evil and Rocky Erickson and the Aliens record, The Evil One. This is a like early 80s psychedelic rock album made by a guy who had just gotten out of a mental hospital. Oh, God. And is also a man who had a number one hit on the Billboard US charts. So what was the hit? this comes uh, for, yeah, like pre, pre this band, he was in another really big psychedelic rock band that was huge in the 60s. I think it's 13th Floor Elevators. They had been. Oh, shit. And this okay. is the lead singer from that band going off and doing his own solo stuff post I never uh, know that. mental institution and this is a really interesting album that i think kind of it, it obviously predates a lot of the daniel johnston stuff that we would define as like outsider art in a sense but it's still very it, it's an interesting like unique exercise of battling with personal demons that I'd, I'd recommend checking out. Uh, as Jake alluded, I listened to an album called uh, Storm of the Lights Bane today. Uh, classic uh, sort of uh, black metal record. Uh, and I loved it. And it, the moment that I was listening to the record, just in the fucking zone, and I saw the Twitter message pop up with Jake recommending a song from it. <laughs> I I felt like I was in a David Lynch movie. Um, it's a testament to the album <laughs> that I literally can't even remember what song on it I was talking about. And anytime I meant think about like what it is, it literally could have been any of them. It could have been um, uh, Thorns mm. of Crimson Death, which is yep. fucking ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It could be Soul Reaper. Just, oh my God. It see, see that, that ties really oh. well to my reaction to the record, which is it started and I was immediately like, holy shit, the song is amazing. And then, and then every song after it, it was was Spare. better than the one before. It just kept getting better. It's good. Um, it's good. It, uh, another sort of black metal influence record that I really loved that I listened to this week is called Wing Souls of Sand by the Angelic Process, sort of black gay shoegaze black metal type deal. Um, yeah. That friend of the podcast Zach recommended to me because I was asking for black gaze recommendations. Um, and it's Unlike any other record I've heard, uh -huh. I think. Um, yeah. I, I, I loved it a lot, but it's like you're putting like so much fuzz on it to the point it's becoming like noise metal at points. Oh um, yeah, that, that album has a lot in common with Boris's feedbacker, TBA. Right. Oh, you know, I, can, I can see the comparison, but um, I enjoyed it muchly. But like, whereas the Dissection record is a song I remember is like, steps up a ladder uh, this record is one i remember more as like an assault of uh texture i guess yeah um but i want to close this off by oh god i have to choose a record um i'm gonna say that this week i listened to shoo shoo's girl with basket of fruit Ooh. and i felt sad yeah, I yeah i'll do that <laughs> Um, something that struck me actually was um, how like bittery and engaging it was. Like the music is really like it engages you right up front the way the music works. Um, it's also incredibly like harrowing and traumatic. Uh, but I don't think it would be as successful if the music wasn't doing so much of the keeping you listening to it, I think. So true. All right. I have had a very prolific week of music listening actually. Um, and since we've kind of blustered through this segment pretty quickly, um, I will take some time to shout out a few different records. Uh, and I'll start with a re listen actually. And I wasn't going to talk about this, but Sersha's just prompted me. I re listened the other day to Shu Shu's album Forget, uh, mm. which is uh, one of their best records. I 
never really fully appreciated it i don't think it's definitely one of the most accessible records it has some of the best songs i think you could play someone to get them interested in um shushu as a band it also has some of the best songs that shushu have ever released um but listening to it this time with a kind of new focus i guess after spending so much time the previous week thinking about oh no uh i really just locked into this album it's a really tight record it's just 10 tracks it's under 40 minutes it's very consistent it's um just relentlessly entertaining from start to finish <laughs> in its opening seconds it will uh <laughs> it'll definitely grab you i'll just say that uh -huh. much. um but it's really um quite haunting and moving and thoughtful as all the best shoe shoe records are uh i've I, re reflecting on it i kind of pieced together in my head that i reckon that it's the middle part of a trilogy that starts with angel guts and ends with um girl with dragon of gir, girl with the trick girl with the basket of fruit um and those Favorite three member of shushu rooney mara and those three records i think are all about um displacement human displacement the idea of kind of having no home uh and and having no freedom uh but specifically uh in the context of stories about young women and young girls as well there are some very difficult um stories that are told about um young girls in trafficking trafficking situations and that sort of thing on those three records um that's kind of a recurring theme um and and that's not something that's necessarily unique to those three records as a point of interest for shushu but I think it's a topic that they examine in a really dense and thoughtful way on those albums. Um, and, and yeah, I think that if you're unsure about Shushu, um, then Forget is definitely a record to check out. Obviously, there's no light, happy, ha-ha Shushu records, but it is one of the easiest to digest. Um, and it's one of the most immediate for sure. It just keeps going. There's a synth pop banger on this album. There's a gorgeous guitar ballad that's easily one of the three best songs they've ever made and yeah just such a, a great album on to new first listens i want to shout out uh i listened to uh first thing i want to shout out is i listened to a the second tori amos album under the pink uh tori amos a great um singer songwriter piano balladess um who released a string of beloved records in the 90s she is an absolute powerhouse um vocally instrumentally everything that she does that i've heard so far is has been utterly transfixing and um she's a great writer as well um this record ends with a nine minute piano ballad about the daughter of Tsar nicholas ii of russia um <laughs> and it's just like she can do anything and make you want to weep basically she's just incredibly um incredibly affecting songwriter uh i have added her debut record little earthquakes which is one of my favorite debut albums of all time to our record club lineup at some point so i look forward to um us eventually getting to talk about that um i also want to shout out i listened to um an, an interesting act that i think i'm gonna do a personal discography deep dive on just because i find them fascinating i listened to an avant-garde metal band called ko dots um debut Ooh, record yeah i listened to their debut Big record fan. choirs of the eye uh, mm -hmm. which, which was a very strange album uh it was not what i was expecting at all uh no weirdly the artist it reminded me of and it's not to say that it necessarily sounds like them but it kind of has the same sort of spirit as liturgy like this mm -hmm. kind of um it's a there, it's definitely a metal record but it has this weird and avant-garde approach to metal where lo, lo, long sections of it will just straight up not be metal at all and then it will come mm -hmm. in with the heaviest shit imaginable uh it's a really strange and interesting record it feels like um i feel like i've barely unpacked it with one listen um but it, it's really interesting stuff i i totally recommend it um uh, you need to check out their album uh coyote i believe it's called i that think was, you would really fuck with that one that's the one zach re recommended to me and i was i saw yeah, yeah, yeah he's a debut. Too. i want to listen to the debut because it had a high rating on Rotary music and i and i really enjoyed it mm -hmm. uh even though it kind of left me befuddled i think it's the best way of describing it but it was a good in a good way it was in a way it was like i actually want mm -hmm. to get this i want to spend more time with it 
but I downloaded their records. I think I'm going to listen to them in order and see how far you, I get. The, the, I was just about to say, going in order is the best way because you have some like really strong heavy hitters at the outset at like, like Hubardo. That's a little bit more closer to the middle, but like that one's fan-fucking-tastic. But I, I find uh, Blue Lambency Downward to be insanely underrated. Um, wow. Not as good as their first and second record, but still I think that that record specifically would be something you would really, really like. Well, I had no idea, Jake, that you were even into this band. So this is really nice. Um, they're a band nobody fucking talks about so honestly i don't even know where i would have mentioned it yeah but no i i uh, that's got me so hype i'm gonna listen probably listen to their second album as soon as i can um i also want to shout out i listened to building on a record that was brought up in last week's what we've been listening to i had my chance to get around to listening to the wonder years album the greatest generation Uh uh-huh which yeah it it really deserves every accolade you could loud on it i think not Mm -hmm. only is this um my favorite uh pop punk album i think it's maybe the most quintessentially perfect pop punk album uh there's just it's a perfect sort of intro to the genre but it's also a perfect kind of encapsulation of everything that makes the genre great there's just a perfect song after perfect song on this thing it's Mm -hmm. kind of absurd how high the quality level is on this thing it's, it's, yeah, just, it's you, just insane you, you just you just wait for it to stop being perfect and and it, and it doesn't and then the album I mean, ends and you're like oh yeah it's it's a it's an absolute 10 out of 10 record um no question about it i really loved it uh and i obviously highly recommend it to anyone who might be watching or listening who hasn't heard it because i i i genuinely i i was a bit hesitant because i was like there was a, such a level of of hype that it was getting from you all and i was like mm, you know this isn't necessarily my bag as much as you guys but then i listened to it and completely floored me so absolutely some people who are fans of that band might even say it's not even their best mm. well we'll see i will be listening to their uh. other records as well uh, <laughs> another record i want to shout out that i listened to um is uh after I think Jake shouted it out a few weeks ago and I finally want I wanted to listen to it as I listened to Tears for Fears album The Seeds of Love yeah. um, which um, actually was mostly brought to my attention uh, by Stephen Wilson who um, mm-hmm. considers it one of his favorite records of all time and did a recently last year I think did a remaster of it and so I listened to the remaster 5.1 remaster and holy shit like regardless of whether you like the songs or not and the songs are great this uh-huh. thing this remaster specifically, I haven't listened to any other um, version of the album, but this remaster is as good as anything, as good sounding as anything Stephen Wilson has ever produced. It sounds as good as fucking Hank Cannot Erase. That's how good it sounds. Uh-huh. Um, and it's and it's this pop album, but it's also this kind of like, uh, it's really like progressive is not really the right way of, of describing it. It is this record that has uh, like eight songs that are all quite long and expanding and stuff, but it's, it's very, um, it reminded me a bit of Primal Scream at certain points, the way it incorporates kind of elements of um, like soul music at certain points as well and other sort of weird places you wouldn't expect the Tears for Fears to go. Uh, I can see why it was not a successful record purely because it, it's so expectation defying. Um, but it's a great album that is stupidly underrated. I'm really glad I got around to, to listening to it. Uh, another album I want to shout out. I listened to so many amazing albums yeah, this did. week. Uh, another album I want to shout out is I listened to the Prefab Sprout album, Jordan the Comeback. So uh, Prefab Sprout are this kind of like, uh, they're a synthy pop, art pop. Um, the genre label that they're lumped in with is a genre label I don't like because it's a really pretentious genre label, but it's sophista pop. Um, which basically means it's 80s pop music that has like lots of really nice and, and pretty instrumentation which is <laughs> anyway it's a really great album it's it's a double album so it's maybe not the best point of entry for prefab sprout although i have to say i found it to be a really immediate listen so maybe it would be a really good point of entry um, but it is a really long album it's a double album uh, and it's just absolutely gorgeous it's one of the again it's it, it's it was a really nice a back double listen with the seeds of love because they're very similar records in terms of their strengths they sound amazing they're really immediate they have these gorgeous hooks and really intricate arrangements um yeah both those those two albums are both amazing for very similar reasons and i highly recommend them um i also want to shout out uh 
<laughs> I listened to so much. I'm going to try and be quick so I can get through more. I listened to uh, the first atheist album, Peace of Time, mm. just trying to get into some more um, classic sort of death metal. Really enjoyed that. Don't have too much to say about it, but I wanted to shout it out because I really dug it. Um, I am not going to spend any time on the two Dillinger Escape Plan records we listened to because that band has already been talked about heaps in this section and I can only co-sign everything that has been said. Uh, I will say that One of Us is the Killer is, is their best album and uh, an absolute oh. standout in the I whole world of, of metalcore. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to shout out, I did a re-listen to an album I haven't heard in years, uh, Kate Bush's Ariel, which is, uh, it, it's basically it was her comeback because when it came out in 2005 it was the first album she'd released oh. in 12 years and it's stunning it's gorgeous it's it's this uh it's really it's again it's another double album it's it's about i can't remember whether it's like 60 70 minutes long it's quite long anyway but you get the suite of um so basically what you get is on this first half you get the series of um storytelling songs from the perspective of various characters some of them are historical um, figures like Elvis Presley and um, fuck who else like famous historical figures and also you get um, stories about fictional people who are close to and also a beautifully moving ballad about Kate's mother who passed away in the lead up to the record beautiful songs on side one and then side two is this 40 minute suite uh, of just incredible uh, gorgeous music it's like her obviously calling back to the ninth wave suite on hounds of love except this is better than that um and i'm not exaggerating it's just better than that um hounds of love is the the better album overall because it's fucking hounds of love but the <laughs> the the it's called the sky of honey i think the suite on the second half of ariel is better than the ninth wave if i had to compare the two which we don't need to do but i did so fuck it anyway ariel was a stunning album just beautiful beautiful music um if you like kate bush uh, you'll love it it's 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 gorgeous not at all difficult to listen to um also want to shout out another revelatory first listen i think i'll leave it here this is the last one i'll, I'll talk about is I finally listened to Julia Halter's Aviary. Yo! Uh, I know a record yes. means a lot to Jake. And holy shit, this is right? the fucking out. I don't know, there's something there was something with me this week about like wanting to listen to a lot of double albums. I uh -huh. just for some reason was feeling Very it. Very pretty double albums, no and, less. And yeah, so I, I actually double featured um the Kate Bush record in this, and it was Ooh. just transcendent. Anyway. Uh, aviary is a lot uh i should have expected how weird it is because of mm -hmm. who julie julie holds it is and how strange her mind is and how how wacky her music can get for lack of a better word um and it is definitely an album that i feel like i need to listen to more and more to unpack yes. in certain respects it reminds me of like a joanna newsom record in that regard like it has so much knotty detail and and um it's like what joanna newsom does with her lyricism is what Julia Holter does with her musical arrangements. It's just so yes. strange and multifaceted and layered and at times completely unfriendly and then at other times gorgeously beautiful. Uh, so not exactly a hot take, but I Shall Love To is the best song she's ever made. Um, good, 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 good take. And I feel like even if you have a favorite Julia Holter song, you haven't heard that once you listen to it. It's like basically her um to draw the draw a kate bush comparison this is her running up that hill that's just it is that yes song? um so yeah it's an it's a, it's an astounding album um cannot recommend it enough my favorite part of listening to julia holter's music is the eventual realization that she's just kind of an insane person yes um <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't immediately give off that vibe um, no matter what you're listening to, like it's it's always unconventional, but like at a certain point, you're just like, can, can she say that? Is that a, what and, the fuck? Is and that a theory? I think is a record where she really leans into that. Yeah, like it opens with this wonderful. Uh, the opening track on this album is astounding. I was like, literally, my jaw dropped as soon as it started, and it's this yeah. and it's this incredible, like uh, epic, um, almost like jazz fusion esque, like massive head trip thing and then like the next 30 minutes of the record it's just the weirdest shit that she's ever made and it's like uh -huh. whoa okay so yeah she really leans into that it's got yeah. something for everyone um yeah the only reason i haven't uh gotten on that already is i just i just that's not a discography that you rush through 
no yeah no not sure. at all. and it is a it's 90 a it's a 90 minute album so so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to be you have to be feeling it you have to be at the right time because it's not easy going i'd say of all the albums all the double records i have shouted out in this segment it's the most difficult one but um but yeah that record and the ko dot record i really look forward to just digging into more and trying to understand because there's enough there for me to know that i love it but also so much that i just can't comprehend yet that i am very much excited to try and, and comprehend yeah so that's basically uh, my week it's been time for august to fuck off somewhere exactly but it's fine we can we can continue without him um so uh, that brings us to the first of our two records to talk about today, which is Took the haze to church, frankincense and murder. The whole thing was a blur. So what is an arm and hammer? Well, if you may be familiar with the name um, because the band Baking took soda. Yeah, the band took their name specifically from the petrol magnet um, and hammer. But yeah, it is um, also apparently a baking soda. I don't, we don't, I don't know if we have it here in New Zealand. So um, I have to, to do my research. But anyway, Arm and Hammer is an American hip hop duo, uh, specifically a New York hip hop duo, uh, consisting of the rappers Billy Woods and Elucid. Um, some of you may or may not, if you haven't listened to Arm and Hammer, you still may be vaguely familiar with them. Um, Billy mm-hmm. Woods has a very successful, well, well, it's all relative. These are, this is an underground rap group um, made up of two very underground rappers. But Billy Woods does, at least within underground hip hop circles, have um, a lot of beloved uh, records, um, specifically his classic album, History Will Absolve Me, which he alludes to on this record. And um, a record that I've shouted out on the podcast in the past, his great collaboration with the producer Kenny Siegel, Hiding Places, which is one of the best albums of, I think, 2019. Fucking amazing record. Love is that, that the one with the cover is like a crooked house? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah, so that's a record that I highly recommend. Um, and so Arm and Hammer is the collaborative duo uh, of Billy and Elusive. And they have been making music for um, about half a decade now i think uh in some form or another um and they released a string of of excellent uh abstract underground hip-hop records Uh, particularly fond of 2018's paraffin which is a really superb and pointed record um and they have particular thematic interests that they visit from record to record they put out a great record last year called shrines as well which is worth shouting out Um, but this is an interesting release um uh because it is marks a collaboration with um probably i would venture to say the hottest producer in hip-hop today the one who is the most uh, attractive to work with um closely followed by kenny beats who i think is nowhere near at the level of of the alchemist personally in terms of talent but both of them are great producers who are in hot demand at the moment um the alchemist has actually been producing uh, some for some big artists recently like well obviously one of the very first records that we reviewed on this podcast was the collaborative record that freddie gibbs did with the alchemist and i'm sure we could all agree though we were mixed on our feelings on that record the alchemist production was for sure one of the absolute best parts of it uh and the alchemist frankly yeah (laughs) the alchemist also did a really good collaborative record that i want to shout out as well with a really great and undersung artist called boldy james um, and they did a collaborative record called The Price of Tea in China, um, even more recently than um, Alfredo, which is a really, really strong record. And, in, and so in all of the records that I have heard The Alchemist on, um, I have been consistently stunned with his production. Uh, it's not particularly showy production. Um, you, you don't necessarily think of him in the same way as you think of, for instance, your Mad Libs and your Jay Dillers and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily wild, wacky, crazy beats, or like your Paul Whites, for instance. No. Um, but they're not exactly wild, wacky, crazy beats, but they are very polished and very intricate. And The Alchemist um, has a really excellent epithet because he has an excellent way of melding his particular style and his particular sound to 
fit in the grooves of the artists that he works with. And so this collaboration with Arm and Hammer, as soon as it was announced, um, obviously immediately got my attention because I enjoy paraffin and shrine so much, but particularly because I thought this is potentially an opportunity for there to be, because the Arm and Hammer records are great, but they're great primarily, and they have great production, absolutely great production. Do not get me wrong, especially paraffin has some awesome beats. Mm -hmm. But when I think of those records, I think primarily of the knotty and difficult and dense lyricism of um billy and elucid and that's still obviously the focal point of this record that is what they're all about is mm -hmm. is their vocal expression but what i always wanted was to get that really great properly like properly great not necessarily classic but like properly great album that i feel was in them was just some production to really like lift them up to that extra level and i am pleased to report that i feel that haram does this in a really uh, satisfying and sophisticated way and again it's not we talk about production and hip-hop in an interesting way and we're obviously very informed by um, what is culturally popular and what is culturally trendy in terms of hip-hop sounds in the alternative world like we often tend to talk about production most we spend the most time talking about production when it's like really off the wall and wild and we think of our our danny browns and our all that sort of thing um, but it really deserves to be stated that the best production is production that, or the idea of good production is that it should match the energy and complement the sound and the atmosphere and the vibe and the content of what the rappers are rapping about. And so we love these big, boisterous, insane albums like Atrocity Exhibition because Danny Brown's absolutely going off his nut and so is Paul White, the producer, and they're just like melding together beautifully. Yeah. Um, but the music of Arm & Hammer is not at all immediate in the way that a lot of these kind of big exciting thrilling uh, alternative hip-hop albums that cross over into mainstream alternative culture are Alm and hammer's music is uh dense uh it is heavily literary as well uh absolutely stacked with uh references to classic literature um theory uh in terms of like race relations uh all kinds of dense it's like they mm. weave this a massive socio-political web in their records of of knotty and strained references that are um you can listen to this album and i've listened to this album i i must have listened to this album at least eight or nine times and you, you can have that experience and you you would be lucky if you picked up maybe one or two references within each song um so, so because not only are there are so many different dense references and not only are they so bewilderingly fast at rapping and they really kind of like whirlwind through their verses but they construct the way that these two rappers play with language and construct their kind of metaphors and allusions and allegories and all that sort of stuff is so inconsistent and i don't mean that <laughs> as, a, as a criticism it's not like it's inconsistent in terms of qual in terms of like how good it is it's just inconsistent in terms of the uh immediacy or the perceptibility of it like sometimes yeah. you'll get a really clear um metaphor or a really clear expression of, of something and then it'll be followed up by something that's you have to like go to genius and look and see what theorists um billy is referencing um when he shouts out the name of like this uh seminal textbook and on a particular branch of philosoph philosophy pronounce yeah. la roche foucault yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Foucault, I mean, I, I, de Coco. maybe like its range is like eclectic in that way, and it uses lots of different tools to build its meaning. Yeah. Um, what I tend to think of is a film like like The White Ribbon, in a way, both in the production and the writing, where it's um, quietly being densely brilliant. You know. Yeah, I mean, there, like, there's definitely a dense brilliance here. I mean, I would disagree on the quiet part. I don't think that's necessarily like. The way no, no, I just mean like it's never, it's always like it's never getting showy. in your face. And being like, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It, feel, it feels honest instead of showy. Yeah, it, it never it. necessarily draws attention to itself. And I, I get, what you, get what you're absolutely saying there. Um, and so, yeah, and th the result of having a record that is so lyrically dense, but also produced by such confident wordsmiths that they do not feel the need, desire, 
and do not ever practically try to draw attention to the things they're trying to communicate. They just weave their webs. And if you get it, great. If you don't, that's fine. It's not for you necessarily. It is, um, it is just their form of expression. It is their form of poetry. But uh, I think that that to me is what makes uh, the music that Armand Hammer makes so alluring because it's um, it's nice to feel like you have a handle on on some sort of aspect of the music, but that you need to dive a little bit deeper into it to truly kind of unpack it. Like I really I've really enjoyed the process of trying to unpack this record, um, even though I'm nowhere near close to it. I do think I have a, a reasonably solid handle on a few songs on this record and a general I a few of the general ideas that um, Billy and Elucid are trying to communicate or trying to examine. It's not necessarily that they try to communicate an idea, but it's more that they try to kind of examine a concept. And that could sound really kind of heady and uh, uninteresting, but obviously these guys have an interest in examining heady concepts, but they want to do it in a way that is, um, that is, that we, we, you're just as intrigued by the sheer aspects of the performance and the ways it's all constructed as you are in like trying to find meaning. Like it's just as satisfying to appreciate this record on a pure technical level as it is to dive into the actual substance of, of what it's about. And <laughs> so um, I have plenty to say, but um, as sometimes it is the case that I get really, I think it was the case with some of the records we talked about last week is I got really, really, really comprehensive and in depth and it kind of maybe leaves some other people with less to add. So I'm gonna take a step back at this point and I wanna hear what, and I'll sort of come back in later and, and sort of see mm -hmm. if I have anything to add. Um, but I wanna hear what your experience with this record has been, each of you, and like what you come away from it with and, uh, yeah how it hits or doesn't hit for you like what is your experience with Armand Hammer the band for me this album is so representative of something I think about a lot with lyrics where like the final product of interpretation is always like really rewarding but the thing I enjoy most is like the process of unpacking um like getting to the end is always a joy but it's it's the act of like applying literary reading to the like messaging that I find so joyous about the writing here. That's not to downplay the excellent production by The Alchemist. Um, I know I was pretty down on the last album we reviewed that uh, he was involved with, um, but the writing here is so good that and his production is only interested in complementing each song as it needs to meet it. So you'll get... Um, something like uh sir benny the opener sir benny miles which is this dreamy hazy like trip hop thing um or something alien something more sort of alienating and uh sort of dark and harsh like indian summer um which i find the production really fascinating here because this is the song that for me best encapsulates why the alchemist is such a good name for the alchemist where he like the act of alchemy of taking um, non-chemical materials and through some sort of mythic process, transforming it into something new is all over the production he does, especially on this song, where you have this particularly harmonious melodic flute line that he transforms into something really quite um, harsh and hard. Um, and I, I just find that so fascinating, the way almost, we've talked about Mad Libs already, but the way in which he, I'm uh, sorry, uh, the way in which those artists do that. Um, but no, um, the writing is great. It's dense. I love the way in which uh, Billy Woods' verse on the opener uh, starts. We're talking about like a fear of the drug trade and then links it to slavery and oppression and absent fathers. And then the trauma from absent fathers leading into drugs. And then it just goes in this loop where if you were to listen to the verse that he does on a loop, it would be a continuous story. Um, told through abstract imagery and that's so beautiful and fascinating um, and that kind of amazing writing is all over this record um, uh, like uh, track 11 um, really eloquently 
sort of calls out the hypocrisy of um posturing in a way well it's saying like fuck the police while you still have a cop in your mind um which is a line on that song uh, and it draws comparisons to uh calling the police pigs whilst being like hogtied not only by the law but by your own mental constraints that have been given to you by living in the system in which police brutality exists um, with the final line about shoving an apple in your mouth being the final humiliation, which of course ties to the cover of the record. Um, and it's just so beautifully done. Um, I also think something worth noting on this record is the fact that the songs on average get longer as the record goes on. Um, and it this sort of evokes this way in which as it goes on, you're getting more beneath the surface, less beneath sort of the sensationalist aspects of it into the nitty gritty. And even though the whole record is so insightful, um, it sort of the fact that it paces itself slower and slower as it goes on evokes so well this feeling of getting more um, in depth, I guess, as you go on. And I just really vibed with it very hard. Um, Old Sweatshirt is great on Falling Out the Sky, which is a highlight on the record. Um, it puts together some of the lightest breezes production on, on the album, uh, while bringing together ideas of street drugs, gentrification of finding oneself, and somehow making a cogent point out of all of these disparate ideas. Um, this is a very fascinating record. I do similarly think this album is pretty fucking fantastic. Um, I just sort of heard it. Uh, I, I was, uh, I think I was driving back from getting my mom the vaccine. And I just sort of threw this on just because a lot of albums dropped on that day. And I just sort of listened to it in the car. And it was like, you know, I didn't really expect. And I, I mean, I'm sort of exaggerating for the sake of hyperbole here. But it's like, I didn't expect a record from these people to just like, occasionally, it just kind of whips like I, I wouldn't say it goes like hard or anything it's not like embellishing in the pop side of this particular genre at all uh but it, it has a certain joie de vivre to it that i think really is epitomized by the alchemist production i th there are so many different specific things that he does i mean from down to like more artificial sounding sort of electronic hits and synths to Occasionally something that I can only describe is if, if it's not a jazz loop, it is designed to sound like a jazz loop. Um, and under normal circumstances, I feel like I would be like, well, this approach to production is just like kind of at odds with itself. And it, it's kind of, but I kind of prefer to thinking of, of uh, like filling in the gaps uh, as it were, just because like I like Tyler have sort of been waiting for a project from these guys where specifically under the Arm and Hammer name, where the two sides of this particular brain or this hemisphere can collide in a way that complement each other. And I think the best thing I can say about the production is that while I think it's really good and really slick, is that it never detracts from the point of listening to this, which is the lyricism. It never draws attention away from that, but it also isn't weak. It's not like an excuse to have subpar beats. Uh, basically, it's just a really well-formed idea, and I think that that's, like, there's a novelty in that, that, like, yeah, if I have one, like, standout problem with this album, it, it might even be more of a me problem. It's just that the lyricism is, in fact, so dense and so obtuse that occasionally, and you're paying so much attention to it, you're just kind of, like, trying to unravel what it means and then the song just keeps going and then you just kind of like trip yourself up and you're like wait 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 wait, gotta catch up uh fuck what is what does this shit mean you like have to listen to this with genius open which like i initially on second listen was just like i like a lot of the production here but all of the lyricism is just like i will like think of one thing and then like a new song starts and i'm like jake oh jake you know what i'm about to say to you on that note what, aren't you, you? what are you saying i'm about to say to you that um it's the same sort of thing as with asap rock that we talked about you, yes i was going i was ex that was the direction i was headed in now, the, i'm curious like, and i'm not trying to like come at mm. you or anything but i'm curious no. what it is about that because i i see them both as equally dense and in similar yeah. ways although they have different kind of subject matter that they are interested mm. in but i'm curious I... about what it is about that that that's different to this in terms of in terms of just the experience of 
of listening to the rapping being disorienting and bewildering and versus being just like a, a, a wild ride that you yeah. love. It, it's it's difficult to parse, but I'm, I like that you brought that up just because I don't think I would have necessarily, like I wanted to mention Aesop Rock because in many ways, this reminds me a lot of Aesop Rock's Labor Days. Um, just in like production, in aesthetic, in like tone, it, it's very similar, even though they're obviously two different artists who are approaching this subject material from very, very different perspectives. Aesop is always kind of irreverent and always like, but he never lets that get in the way in the personal. And I think that it's more that personal edge to it, not to imply that Elucid and Billy Woods aren't, they very much are. And that's a lot of what makes this record hit hard is that it manages to combine the, like the really, really not even broad, just the incisive observations about systemic racism and how it specifically affects them. They don't trade one side for the other, like, because sometimes, you know, and it's not like it's inherently a bad thing. Sometimes you focus more on the personal, sometimes you focus more on the societal, and you want to aim your missiles to the point that are going to play to your strengths better, and it's just kind of depends. Uh, but, you know, if you're good enough to maintain a balance, go ahead and try it. And I think this pretty much gets there. It's just that with the difference between Aesop Rock is that like, and I would have to say it's Aesop Rock's uh, earlier stuff too, just because I think the production is so much of what makes his uh, 2010s and now like, and last year's album so refreshing is that he's leaning into a side of his sound that he hasn't before that's like way less organic. Um, but there is a, I, I guess a witty exuberance and sort of a you know, not to say this one's devoid of humor, but it's like, I wouldn't go into Haram listening, expecting a listen to be like, yo, this is uh, fun, ha ha ha. Like, no, this is like sitting, <laughs> I hate this analogy because it makes it sound boring as shit, but it's like sitting down to like read theory. It's like a, a lecture in a certain sense, like, yeah. a really, like a really good one, but also like yeah. oh, this one that's the, being the, given the scene in by Spike a Lee's Black poet. Klansman. That's the yeah, fucking, like, that's the album. <laughs> anyone who's been to university knows that you, when people say it's like a lecture, it evokes a certain kind of professor. This album is not like that kind of professor. No, it's like the, no, 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 no. It's like the one who actually cares that you pay attention and makes it fun. Um, it, what I wanted to say is I was hoping you would bring up that specific distinction, Jake, that, that idea of like a reverence and personality versus mm -hmm. I think a an interest in... Um, with the, at the risk of sounding pretentious when I say this, but an interest in the academic that um, mm -hmm. that Arm and Hammer have, like we talk, we often talk about meaningful rap in terms of blending the personal and the political and the personal society mm -hmm. and the societal. And this record does that, and a lot of great records do that. But this record, what I've come to realize is this record kind of goes further than that and this band kind of go further than that yes you have very moving personal stories on this record um, Billy talks on multiple occasions about uh, I think the death of his father mm -hmm. or attending family funerals and, and things like that and even Earl Sweatshirt when he shows up as well touches on this theme as well um, but it, it's it's less about drawing a link between personal experiences and wider societal problems and it's more about kind of more even even more widely than that integrating the personal with the political with the philosophical uh with the cultural it, it kind of just mm -hmm. goes all over the map and it draws these links between particular cultural uh behaviors and particular cultural attitudes and uh, and, and we'll make these kind of broad sweeping comparisons to uh, other things. And I'll, I'll get into it when I analyze this more deeply, but it goes, I think, a little bit further than just like finding neat little analogies mm -hmm. between, oh, this shitty thing that I experienced and the suffering of my people. It goes so much, it's so much more complicated than that. And that's not necessarily like, that might be a thing that just pushes people away. Like it might be a point where certain people are like, okay, great not necessarily for me i i or maybe i'm just not in the mood for this but i think it is ultimately the defining characteristic of arm and hammer as an act and i think that it's what to me it's what makes them really great and really interesting and really fascinating to dig into uh in the same way that a really kind of dense novel is really really interesting to read or a a great piece of of philosophy but um 
but it's also on this completely different level because it's interesting in the way that those things are but it's also like all of those different things in one so it's just a lot (laughs) to process basically yeah um uh i uh fuck oh uh i ah, shit what fucking oh okay the one of the differences i think that like that you're getting at is that it's it's more than just that is that um Aesop first and foremost is like while their structure, like their styles, I guess are similar is that Aesop is a character. And I would really more relay Arm and Hammer here as like a, just more an experience. I know that sounds kind of like vague and pretentious, but it's just like, it's relaying. I, I guess the, the best way to make this point is by, I think the song, I don't even know if necessarily it's my favorite song on the record, but I think it's just the most quintessential this album song uh that is robert moses um uh, which i do think is a fantastic song um which obviously the title references basically the most influential political figure in the history of america who was not a politician he was this like also fucking deplorable human being who basically pro like preyed on the idea of white wealth and just sort of used that to build an infrastructure on like the East Coast that basically just stacked layer upon layer upon layer uh, of obstacles for the lower class. And is is basically like, I I would compare his influence, well, and his politics and his influence to that of like Henry Kissinger in the sense that it's like their actions affected so much more than what they were just immediately talking about. And it was it was also like literally layers of obstacles because he would like yes. he, he put like literal like freeways through um, mm-hmm. through project neighborhoods and and bulldozed um, housing complexes and stuff like that. So the yeah, it's an, an interesting figure to have been brought up on this record, and I'm glad that someone mm. I, I I'm glad that you brought that up actually, so I, I don't have to bring up every <laughs> allusion on this record to a interesting, interesting person or thing. Interesting cunt, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, and it's not just like the title of the song and the fact that they do get into like the like the nitty gritty of not necessarily. Yeah, this is why this is emblematic of the album is that it's not necessarily like getting into the nitty gritty of like Robert Moses himself, but rather the effect that the man had. It's not like yeah. addressing I, him. I, I don't think he's actually talked about explicitly at no, all. That's it's just it, it's just a kind of a signifier to kind of get you in a particular or prime you to be in a particular mindset when you approach a certain a certain verse or a certain thing that's being talked about at that point on the record. Um, and they're great at doing that. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say. Is that like it's it's showing you the effect, and I also kind of find it to be like kind of powerful because like that's this is not the only time this happens on the album. Uh, not even like name dropping, but it's just like their desire to relay the experience um, honestly uh, is never compromised for having like a lack of specifics. Like they give you everything you need, but they also don't address people like Robert Moses directly other than like again in the illusion of the title itself and it's like it's kind of like a reclamation in my opinion that they just sort of like are taking away the novelty of just like this this guy doesn't deserve to have his name spoken about by me I'm going to talk about how this affected me how this affected my family how this affected people that I know and people that I love and people that I didn't know and there's just so many great little moments of lyricism on here fucking uh he starts comparing uh or he starts dropping references to lots of really influential political figures like uh Rafael Edmund III, Mandela, Joseph Stalin, <laughs> Joseph Stalin Stalin on him who better <laughs> just well, what a bar. I made, I, I made a note of the Nelson Mandela line because I found it so impactful um Nelson Mandela is smiling forever or something like that which to me seemed like such a powerful commentary on the way that after their like death uh the sort of white liberal mainstream like co-ops yeah, well, very this is, controversial. This is a thing. thing. Mm-hmm. This is a thing. Um, black celebrities or, or black public figures being kind of whitewashed in some way mm-hmm. is a thing that's um, talked about at multiple different points on this record. And it's not necessarily about the image of someone being like corrupted by these kind of external forces. There's a great uh, moment on this record where 
uh, I think it's Billy, it's one of the two brings up Wesley Snipes uh, yes. specifically. And the, mm. the way in which uh, Wesley Snipes was this obviously great, uh, successful film star who eventually went to prison for tax evasion. And it yes. was like interesting the ways in which he was kind of like used as an illustration um, mm-hmm. and as a, sca- as a scapegoat, as a, as yeah. a, he his whole image was transformed and he became well, you see I, I took that line to me it's obviously about that but what i got out of it on the first couple of listens was something kind of different because in the context of the song it's in the lyrics around it are kind of about like um different ways of uh approaching like racialized barriers to your success yeah um and one of the things they talk about is um becoming like uh, a white person with black skin to yeah. put it in delicately yeah um, you're and, right that's exactly you're exactly what it's about yeah yeah and so that allusion to wesley snipes becoming just another rich corporate person who evades taxes seemed to me to be about that as well as about uh, what you're alluding to yeah exactly there's this that, that's in the song um black sunlight which i think is one of the best songs on the whole album mm-hmm. It brings up this notion of um, the specific um, couplet is iridescent blackness is this performative or praxis. And it's this, um, you know, interrogating this notion of like whether, <laughs> whether you know, whether, whether culture is, is something that is utilized by certain people um, to project a particular kind of image or whether it's something that's actually being actualized through behavior. Um, and how sort of culture and cultural uh, images are constructed, whether it's this, whether they're purely constructed through through images um, and through performance, or whether they're constructed through um, meaningful action, um, and then they kind of go into this kind of Wesley Snipes connection, um, and in terms of like how Wesley Snipes kind of both constructed and had constructed both enacted the construction of and and had constructed a particular kind of image that ultimately reinforced a. Uh, uh, a particular place and culture um, for African Americans in Hollywood or in the world of entertainment. Um, there is a specific specific series of bars toward the end of this verse where he says, "Black bastards, Negro humor, laugh in the casket, yellow teeth, incisors flashing. Some nights the sun shines. Just got to catch it." Which I think is kind of uh, almost drawing this kind of vampiric uh, evocation. Um, of of Wesley Snipes and and of um, celebrity and of um, whiteness and all that kind of thing. So um, yeah. So th- again, I've only barely started to kind of pick up on these kinds of connections and what's actually being suggested with these lines. But there's so much here; it's really yeah. dense. Yeah, I mean the the way I would sort of compare Aesop Brock to this is that. Um, this is just way more dense. Um, <laughs> I, I think, in terms of delivery, it's somewhat similar. And Aesop always explores so many ideas um, more so than your your average rapper, and in a in a different way than your average rapper. But I think there's like there's just so many more meanings to this album that can be drawn on in comparison to something like the impossible kid which is like like i um like spirit world field guide if i can put this sort of punctually um like that has like dog at the door that's like a quintessential aesop rock song to me um just because it's like hilarious but also kind of pointed about the way that he feels inside his own head and uh, it's 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 and it's got that's that delivery that's like iconic of his and um you know i would say like the definitive song from this uh let's see if i can get the name right fucking brain power uh black sunlight yeah um like i there's obviously not much of a comparison to be made between those two songs and i think they're kind of indicative of yeah. the the people creating them I, um, I, I think what it is is it's just like 
relative size of the things you're biting off and trying to chew like the thing is as well the 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 if we we should clarify to our listeners who probably already have realized at this point, we're only obviously making this Aesop rock comparison in terms of like need having a kind of technical comparison. But it is important to acknowledge the fact that Aesop Rock is a white rapper who raps about his kind of psychological problems and his sort of state of mind. Um, Arm and Hepper are two Arm and Hammer are two black rappers who, for obvious reasons, have more knotty and systemic and and dense subject matter that they're interested in and that they're obviously personally connected to so it's entirely different it's not just the fact that these are two sets of rappers who are incredibly technically proficient and rap really fast and use really dense uh, metaphors and all that sort of stuff it's the fact that in order to do the particular things they're interested in justice these two acts have to have different approaches and one is going to be more consumable than the other purely as a result of that yeah but what i would say is is that this is you know uh aesop will have like uh there's there's a dog barking outside is that an axe murderer and arm and hammer will have a a sample of that video of alan iverson talking about practice where which if you i just want to say if you all haven't seen the video of alan uh, just type in alan iverson practice video and it'll come up it it, you feel like you're going insane watching it because the I, i can't remember the circumstance exactly but the dude says practice in the span of three minutes i think like 25 times and it, it, it was just like a fully surreal, hysterical moment captured on live television. What it is, and um, I think the reason I can actually, I feel like I can actually explain this, why it's even in the song. Um, because they, 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 that line I've said before, Eridus and Blackness is this performative praxis. The very next line is, are we talking about practice? Which is the line that evokes, not even yeah. evokes, it's just that's exactly the line that Iverson says yeah. in the video. That's what, that's what he says. And I think the reason that's in there is again, it's, 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 it's commenting on this. It's actually some really interesting wordplay where it's like, it's word playing on the two different meanings of the word practice, like in terms of to prepare for and as one interpretation and in terms of like actually enacting as another uh, definition of the word practice. And it's like, they're looking at the idea of like, in terms of being black and in terms of like black culture, um, what matters more is it is it um how we uh perform blackness or is it how we practice blackness and uh, these two things might seem like the same thing but they kind of try and get at this distinction between the two of them and i think the iverson clip my interpretation of the iverson clip to me is he's kind of my takeaway from that clip is he's kind of i think bewildered at the fact that he's being asked about his practice like, why would you give a shit about what I do when I'm practicing when all that matters is what I do when I'm on the court? Yeah. And I think that they're trying to draw an illusion to that um, with what they're interrogating in terms of like what it means to to be a part of a yeah, particular culture. The, the, the question asked uh, to Iverson was sort of like, a, and his answer really is what made the broader implication of like, what you do off the court almost matters like way more than when you're on the court. So it's like, there's a, there's a, a clear parallel to be drawn between sort of performative race stuff and uh, for lack of a better word, practical uh, race. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And just to clarify what I mean by that is like, performative being like these kinds of coded specific actions and signifiers that make that make you uh black or or any kind of group that you belong to that's one set so that's one thing that's being evoked by the performative part and the praxis part slash practice part is like you know actually just being and behaving and and being black outside of you know what you have to do to be perceived as belonging to that group like you know what i mean it's like the difference between um, essentially really what 
white America perceives as black and the yeah. relationship between that and, and being and, actually black. And because that's not an experience that any of us can speak on, I do think we can still draw an analogy to something like the performance of gender, for instance. And you can kind of mm. apply very similar principles uh, and you can kind of take the same kind of takeaway um, and apply it to that world as well. So that's what I think is so great about Armin mm. Hammer is they can speak on these different kind of incredibly complicated and, and sensitive subjects, but they'll do it in a way that really gets to the to the philosophical or the um, ideological core of it so that you can yeah. then apply it to other things. While I'm jabbering, uh, I'll just go ahead and say that if it wasn't obvious, I do like this album quite a bit. Um, it's been an interesting journey of sort of, like uh, the first time I listened to it, I was in line at the pharmacy. So I, I, I really did nothing but just listen to it from a sort of surface level. Um, second time I had the lyric sheet up and was sort of pouring through it. And the third time I did the same thing, uh, sort of eat in, in even in more depth than before. And my takeaways from the first listen were like, this is really good. These two guys are fantastic rappers and writers. Um, but I, I can't help but feel like uh, the, the production lets it down a little bit, frankly, in the back half. Um, oh, big, big disagree. But that's fine. Um, it's, I don't know. It, it gets samey in the back half there. Um, uh, thankfully, finishes strong with Robert Moses and um, fucking, you know, the last one. Stone fruit. That'd be the one. Um, those two are great, but like they run from uh, really just three songs of wishing bad sugar. Ro- ch- oh. ch- fucking, you know the one. <laughs> I, know, I can't make myself remember them. That's fine. For the life of me, just everything, everything around them um, stands out far more in my estimation. It's funny because one of those one of those the, three songs I think is is like the key song one of the key songs on the album. So this is going to be an interesting counterpoint between you and me again. Well, this is again part of my larger point, which is, is I'm still working on this thing. Um, I simply have not had the time uh, to unpack it uh, at every level. So I mean. I, I guess what I'm saying is don't be surprised if if this review is completely out of date in a month. I I don't think either Woods or Lucid have one miss in terms of the way this is written and performed, but I just I can't I can't fully get behind the alchemist yet between this and Alfredo. I'm like, okay, I hear I see the I, I hmm. It's like, I see what the appeal is, but the appeal is not so much appealing to me at this particular juncture. Um, and I would, I would say on like something like Black Sunlight, it's like, fucking, yes, exactly. Yeah. I get nice it. I've, um, I've cracked the code. Yeah, I, I will say that God's Feet is far and away my least favorite track on the album. Because I ad- addendum to my statement uh, is that in the performance there is one miss between Woods and Elucid, and I think that's that sort of off-key singing thing that they're doing. God's feet is un- unbelievably annoying, and I, I, fr- I just frankly think the Alchemist adds nothing to that song. But I, I don't know why the fuck I'm focusing on the negative because yeah. this album is great. Yeah. I mean, look, am I just talking a bunch of shit here? Like well, I think you make an interesting. Do point. I make sense right now? I, I, I think you did make sense, and you said something that I think was interesting, which is that, um, and and is very Morgan, which is that maybe one of the reasons you struggled to necessarily connect with it is that it's not like an especially overtly emotional record, and and a lot of the times the kind of personal coming through in a really strong way is something that I know you really connect with, in, in terms of the immediacy of responding to music, and like we've already said, this is one of those academic records where you can appreciate immediately all the technical aspects, but in terms of actually having the record get under your skin in a particular way, this is a record that, as I said at the very beginning, is really no interest in doing that. It's not a record that's trying to relate to you, uh, or um, 
help you form a connection with it. And it's just, it's a sort of thing where it's like, hey, you want to spend time unpacking, unpacking this? That's up to you, but we're not going to give you the, we're not going to like, um, you know, do this whole thing where we start, you know, rapping about real shit and in and, and our, and our hard lives and shit. Like there's allusions to that, but it's all wrapped up in the, the big metaphor web of the whole thing. So it's not surprising that it, that this is not a very immediate record because it very deliberately makes the choice not to be um, personal in the way that immediate, we Immediate, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, and it, that's part of what makes it so hard to sort of quantify on a form like this um, is because there's so much that I appreciate about it that like, it saves me more time almost to say the things that I, I don't really appreciate about it and kind of focus on those. Because like, if I were to sit here and unpack every single thing that I like about this album, uh, like slash love, we would be here until uh, 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, and, you know, no one wants to hear that from me because I'd just be like, you know, sitting here like, yeah, man, I like that part where he fucking talks about Alan Iverson and like, there's a lot going on there, man. No, just be you know from here until tomorrow. So uh, it's really it's what I have to say is that I, this is a work in progress, and I think it's going to get more rewarding as time goes on uh, and get more listens in and sort of unpack it as we go. August, what do you think of this album? Yeah, and what do you what are your what's your perspective? So um, right off the bat, just so I can get through the more negative opinion stuff, I, I will say that I do, for the most part, agree with a lot of Morgan's criticisms of this record, particularly of the production and of the song God's Feet. I'm pretty much exactly in line with how he feels about those two. Uh, so I guess I'll just get into my more original thoughts uh mainly in that i think the the way this record is is written to me is the most fascinating part of it because i i spent the better part of this week trying to like create like a how i think this album is written like what that what exactly just not necessarily the words being written themselves, but more the way the words in which the words are being written, like how I would describe that. Uh, and I, I kind of came up with the tentative term of like fractal writing for how I would describe how this record is written down. Um, it, it feels to me in the similar model to like a, a fractal, it is a bunch of branching pathways from a larger whole that individually, those smaller pathways are themselves a whole, but also, re but also still part of this greater whole that becomes the broader idea that the band is getting at. And I think this is really perfectly illustrated with the song Falling Out of the Sky. Uh, which of course features Earl Sweatshirt. Uh, this song is very broadly a reflection on one one on like a person's life being upset and the way that affects a person. Earl takes this from the perspective of his father's death. Um, Billy takes this through the perspective of moving to a new city and Elucid takes it from the perspective of simply going to summer camp. These three very distantly related ideas all coming back to this greater whole. Each one small, one, uh, these ideas are obviously smaller, more specific and more individual to certain people, but they represent this greater theme of a life being upset. And that's exactly why I think the writing here is reminiscent of a fractal, these smaller parts that are ultimately just copies of each other, but in subtle, interesting ways. Um, it, it feels like uh, it, it's just very interesting because that's also the way like individual lines on here are written, like uh, the grim opener, Sir Benny Miles, having a lot of 
distantly related lyrical concepts, but ultimately a song. When I compounded what was being said all together in my mind, I took it as a song about the increased militarization of the US and how that leaves so many people uh, without hope and dreading. And that without hope stuff can of course be more broadly interpreted on its own, the military, the militarization aspect coming up more in Elucid's verse. And I thought that was just a really fascinating thing the two did, how they would rap about these entirely different things with one similar whole point and leave you, the listener, to conclude what you think that whole point is, not only, but also kind of bring your own life experiences into that whole. It was really fascinating to try and parse through so many of these songs. And there, there's plenty I feel I have about figured out. And uh, like I'm sure most of you, there's plenty I feel I have still miles to go with the understanding and what every song means. But I think lyrically, it's a really brilliant record, evocative of a lot of my favorite artists in terms of the way they write so cryptically. Uh, but yeah, it's this really fascinating record that I just feel I would like to spend a lot more time with. And that's, that's kind of how I feel about it, yeah. Oh, beautifully said. I loved some of those um, connections and I liked the discussion of um, the fractal structure as well. I would not have thought of that. And yet that's a beautiful, I think, way of of even visualizing and, and, and trying to conceptualize how to approach deciphering this album. Uh, yeah, again, you do have this kind of structural offhand, offhandedness that um, really takes disorients and I, I didn't really have a handle on this record until I, I think well like I didn't really have a handle on how to even listen to this record until like the third time I heard it I think uh, I was the first couple times I listened to this I was literally just it was just happening to me it was just like letting it flow over me and I knew to to do that from the start I knew to just like not try and go in and, and understand on the first listen I had learned that lesson in the past with this duo um, and I think that it makes it so much richer once you just let the sensory experience happen to you and then start um, picking it apart. And like I said earlier, I, I definitely don't have a handle on everything that's talked about on this record by mm. no means. Um, I have loose um, observations, basically. And, one, and one thing I will briefly interject yeah. about the sensory experience that I think makes this record so interesting is the use of of like uh, samples from films to like yes like make one song flow into another i'm gonna bring up one of those that okay. i'm that i'm stunned no one else has mentioned maybe because they didn't notice it but i'm gonna bring up one of those in a minute um yeah that, that's great you're right this whole thing does also have a really good flow and i said uh earlier in the episode that i list i've listened to this record like seven times in the last uh, 48 hours and the reason is not that you know i want to i keep putting this thing on again and again and again to try and understand it that was part of it but also just the fact that it has this really immaculate flow from start to finish it feels like this continuous journey you're being taken on and as soon as it's over i just let the repeat button take effect and i just let it i've just been letting it start again and happen again to me because it feels like this beautiful um cohesive structure uh that is full of all these different parts that feel like they're interconnected in ways that are really satisfying. Um, I think the track uh, opens, uh, the track, the, the album opens really brilliantly with Sir Benny Miles. I love the cascading warbled synth and the vocal sample on this track, both of which are real alchemist um, uh, trademarks, I guess, um, from what I've heard. Um, some really uh, beautiful um, and, and hard hitting bars from Billy. I love the um, bars that open this record. Dreams is dangerous, linger like angel dust, ain't no angels hovering, ain't no saving us, ain't no slaving us. You're gonna need a bigger boat, you're gonna need a smaller ocean, but here's some more rope. You're automatically thrown into this uh, jungle-like uh, world of 
uh, images that are kind of like following from each other, but then kind of contorting and twisting the last image and, and base using wordplay to do that. Really, really uh, awesome and, and cool stuff. And it's also really satisfying when you realize that a piece of cultural ephemera that you like is being referenced in an obscure way and you pick up on that. Um, that's something cool that happens on this record, happened on this record a few, a couple times to me. Um, and I think also this opening track gives you a really good indication of uh, if you're if this is the first time you've encountered Arm and Hammer, uh, it gives you a really, really good indication of who these two guys are and what their personalities are, how they are similar as performers in terms of um, performance and interests, but also how they differ as well. Billy, um, is, this is why I, when it comes back to the question of which I prefer out of Billy Woods and Lucid, I'm going back and forth all the time. It really depends on what mood I'm in or what uh, thing from them I last heard. Um, but I, I particularly love um, Billy's vocal style. He has this real kind of urgency in the way that he raps um, that particularly comes, comes through in his solo material, I think is one of the great appeals of his solo material, but he brings it full force into Arm and Hammer as well. Billy sounds really like he's desperate to get words out at certain points. He sounds like he, there are certain points on this record and I think on anything that Billy raps on where you almost get the sense that it feels like he's rapping with a gun to his head. Um, you just get that real sense of intensity in his performance that I really, really love. Uh, Elucid is certainly intense in his own way as well, but much less so. Um, Elucid's much more, or Elucid's performance gives the impression of being much more considered and moderate, but also at the same time, he balances that with a vocabulary and a lyrical style that's even more visually strange and esoteric than Billy. Uh, he... Uh, Elusive will go from random image to random image, random evocation to random evocation in a way that I think has less immediate logic than what Billy does. I find Billy's verses easier to pass and easier to dig into than Elusive's. Elusive's can be quite esoteric and, and strange in a, in a way that is very distinct. Um, so there's these two different personalities and the first time I encountered Arm and Hammer I, I found it difficult to I think distinguish between them they have kind of similar but different performance styles and ways that I've touched on but I think the more I listen to it the more I appreciate the nuances and the ways that they're different and I think that all of that is on display in Sir Benny Miles a great album opener um, uh, then you have a interesting uh, development not the first time they've done this on the record but you go immediately into a second track which is actually a solo track uh, in this instance it's an elusive solo track and he raps about body autonomy on this track um, and he specifically has a really great line that stuck out to me as one of the most immediate lines of the record which is um, uh, my new name colonizers can't pronounce which I think is a really kind of uh, awesome statement about um, seizing control and seizing agency uh, in a particular environment in which that is systemically removed from you. Um, and also, again, I talked about, because I know we can't speak on the Black experience, we just can't, but I talked about before how we can see things in this music that I think is analogous to our own experiences. And obviously some of us can probably see the analogy in terms of um, trying to, coming up with a new name in order to uh, validate your autonomy. So there's a cool wee connection there. Um, it's a really short track, this one, but I, I love the beat on it. I think it's a really great song, even though it's only about a minute and change. It has this really colorful and shimmering synth beat. Just really awesome stuff. I love it to bits. Uh, we've already kind of talked about Black Sunlight. I really don't need to spend much time on that. We've really dissected that well, I think. Uh, or at least we've dissected Billy's verse and we didn't even go, get into... Um, uh, Elucid's verse, but they're actually quite connected on the song because both of them are talking about, again, that notion of performative versus practical blackness and also how specifically El Elucid get, Billy brings up the Wesley, Wesley Snipes uh, incidents and Elucid kind of elaborates on that um, in terms of how blackness is performed in the hip hop world specifically. And in the musical world, he talks a lot about um, how he fits versus doesn't fit in the particular mold of this kind of uh, performer. And uh, he's really great. It's a really good verse. Um, 
and i also want to shout out on the song this song also has some of the best production on the record i think i love the chopped up hook that's provided by kayana it sounds like a sample they the alchemist deliberately tries to make it feel like a sample um and she sings these lines like you bring the skies out you make the night pop off and it sounds like an old song sample but it's actually recorded specifically for this song which i think is really awesome the way that that's manipulated the way that her vocal lines kind of cut into the verses at certain points to kind of underline certain lines really great stuff um uh i uh, absolutely awesome um indian summer also again i i definitely see where, where morgan was coming from when he said the beats on the second half of the record maybe aren't as good i don't think they're not as good but they're certainly not as they don't jump out at you as much in the second half of the record as they do in the first half and indian summer is another really standout beat i love the flute sample in this song uh it's a it's another really um a moving song actually i think this is one of the first moments on the record where you really get a sense of the emotion that these guys are able to communicate when they are interested in doing that um and billy's verse in particular i think really stands out here it's very autobiographical uh it, it almost sounds iconic to me the first few lines of this verse i swore vengeance in the seventh grade not on one man the whole human race i'm almost done god be praised i'm almost done every debt gets paid i used to cut grass and smile like i meant it we squatted in the shade when the mowers overheated came home stinking of gas in the evening it wasn't any one thing it was the sequence the intoxication of counting cash in secret the secret hiding places where you keep it um, so I could easily just keep going because the verse flows so well. Um, and so in this song, um, he starts talking about his father's death and he talks a little bit about the menial work that he did as a drug dealer, which is uh, in those lines that I just quoted. And I like the way in which that he ties this work that he had to do, this selling weed or whatever. Uh, he, and he kind of draws a connection with other forms of menial um, work that um, no one enjoys doing, but that are necessary to do under the American capitalistic system. And I like the way in which he kind of comments on indirectly the ways in which um, certain forms of menial work are so, not only socially acceptable, but encouraged and seen as a, a standard for living by certain people, but other things that are equally menial are these are persecuted and targeted and seen as or to look at it from another perspective, um, we think of broadly culturally, we think of people who do like zero hour contract work, who work for like Amazon or whatever, and have this re these really um, poor conditions and really bad jobs. We, we, we take pity on them and we have sympathy for them, but we don't necessarily as a society have the same level of sympathy for someone who sells drugs um, necessarily, even though these kinds of two forms of work are effectively equally insecure and equally vulnerable to the people that are doing them. And so Billy's talking about this in this verse, and he's not ever spelling any of this out directly, but it's stuff that you uncover the more you read into these lines. It's so fucking genius. I, I, I absolutely adore it. Um, so good. Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that I've spent a lot more time actually passing Billy than I have passing Elucid uh, on this um, album, but they're both excellent on this song as well. Um, great, great song. Oh, and actually, hang on, where is it? I think this is the song that has... Yeah, there's another really, really great line in, uh, in Billy's verse in this song that I, I immediately, the very first, this was the, the first time I heard this album. This was the one line that jumped out at me straight away. Uh, 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 one of a few lines, but this was like the one couplet that really jumped out at me. Um, uh, Kill one, only bring more and more like dead explorers. I put a neat hole in Indiana Jones fedora. Um, so what's great about that is obviously he's talking about colonization and he's talking about all that sort of stuff and and that that much that often discussed topic of the <laughs> as as fun and awesome as the indiana jones movies are you know the second you kind of take a microscope to the ethics of it it all falls apart but it's not like preachy about that or anything it's just funny because what he's saying is he puts a bullet hole through indiana jones fedora but it's also a pun because he's um in terms of colonization you can also hear it as i put a neat hole in indiana jones for dora as in the explorer, as in dead explorers, which is referenced in the very last bar. So he, he has this line about dead explorers, and then he has a line about killing Indiana Jones, Fedora, um, which I just immediately made me crack up. I thought it was the funniest line on the whole album. And it's pointed and it's meaningful, but it's also just a really irreverent and funny and just God tier wordplay. 
So <laughs> shout out to Billy for that because that fucking made me laugh so hard. Um, then you get into Aubergine, uh, which is another song that I think is interested in or examines um, the place and the role and the performance of rappers and of black entertainers and hip hop specifically. Um, uh, again, I haven't really necessarily um, passed Elucid's verse too well at this point. It's very, Elucid's verse on this track is very kind of flowy and floaty and strange and, and, and hard hitting in a way that I can't explain why. Um, like he has lines like clarity is conflicted smoke and tarry then i listen in the valley intervention take my time for a spell being strengthened a renewal i reflect i remember i've been gassed i've been running off potential he goes on and on and on like this and it's like i have no idea what he's really talking about in this verse but it's this combination of words that he's able to put together it just makes me is really evocative and i really want to dig into it but billy's verse on this song i think i do have a handle on and again um, touches on this notion of um, the performance of rap stars. Um, there's a great line where uh, he says, West World, mm, in words re rebooting, recycling the same shooting, rappers tired, inertia the only thing, keep him moving. So this is a really interesting commentary on how certain performers in um, in the rap world will recycle the same shooting. They will draw on, they will embellish and exaggerate um, certain hardcore experiences that they've had um, because that is the way to kind of get attention that is the way to kind of get success this perception of realness is the way to be taken seriously as a rapper so uh, plenty of rappers I'm sure have experienced really incredible um, life-changing hardships but he comments on I guess the fakeness of some of it the sense in which some people who perhaps haven't had those experiences to the same degree have to take some kernel of a thing they've experienced and blow it up and make it this whole like part of their pers artistic personality. Um, and this line inertia is the only thing that keeps them moving is an another great comment commentary on that. The only reason that um, these rappers have relevance is that there are these particular things that they have utilized to get people's attention that people come back to and focus on again and again and again and it's a kind of criticism of these rappers as well it's saying you're not necessarily you're falling back too much you're not doing enough to innovate you're not doing enough to actually be artistically forward looking and, and progressive you're letting this you're letting yourself be caught in this so it's a really interesting perspective because it's really layered this album in the sense that Billy examines these topics in which people are victimized, but he doesn't necessarily always have this two-dimensional view of victims and oppressors. They, both Billy and Elucid, have this approach where they examine in a way that feels truthful um, the actual place of and culpability of people in these kinds of situations. Yes, you're uh, in this kind of system where you're expected to be a certain way and you're rewarded for being a certain way, but also what are you doing to try and circumvent that? You can't wait for someone else to save you. And all of this is just in the context of the rap world. But again, all of it can be extrapolated to apply to any kind of situation in which someone uh, has to be performative in a particular way in order to achieve success or in order to be taken seriously. So again, Absolutely, I, I know I'm really going overboard on this, but it's really difficult not to because it's just that kind of album. A great song. Uh, God's Feet is definitely one of the, uh, God's Feet at State's End, ha. Huh? God's Feet is definitely one of the <laughs> uh, shorter and, and less substantive tracks on the record. I do really like it. It has, actually has a production credit uh, for Earl Sweatshirt, who worked on the beat with The Alchemist and also worked on the beat with The Alchemist on the song, which he features as well, which I'll get to. Uh, I quite like the hook on the song. Uh, it's quite deathly and somber. Um, blow that horn fast, we've been ready to go. When that horn blasts, the dead is coming home. So this idea of um, death, but also this idea of death bringing a kind of comeuppance on, um, or like the, the past, something that has perished, kind of coming back to haunt the present in a certain way and it's not necessarily explored in a lot of detail in this song it's a very short song it just has one very short verse from elucid 
Um, but that's quite a potent verse. He says, you have enough air in your lungs. When it's time, you'll know you won't have to think. You'll just do. In the blink of an eye, the faith will go where they are made whole. So the story goes, if the dead come in home, prepare a table, make him a pallet, leave your freshest linens, find a spirit getting lifted, singing murder ballads, looking for a body, the dead is coming home. So that's a, a short, but I think potent verse about, again, this idea of, of the chickens coming home to roost, let's say, and leave it at that. Um, peppercorn. Pepper, not peppercorn, pepper tree, sorry. I keep calling it peppercorn when I was writing my notes as well. And so we have had a lucid solo tracks on this record. This is a Billy Woods solo track. And again, I think this is a really interesting song. Um, and I, this is one of the songs on the record I think I have the most of a handle on. Uh, and it's a song about, um, specifically about visiting his family's ancestral home in Jamaica. Uh, and specifically the fact that most of the time when he had the opportunity to visit that place as a young person, it was because he had to go home for a family funeral. Um, and so what it's done is it's formed this association for Billy between this place of ancestry, this place where he comes from and has these deep roots and death. Um, and, and again, he, he takes this connection through the story of, of a single funeral that he attends. He, he takes that and he moves outward to examine and interrogate the idea of whether living in the past or revisiting the past or thinking about the past is a kind of death. Uh, and this is one of the great moments on the album where I think that the Alchemist production doesn't just, you know, complement and provide a nice bed for the music, but actually... Uh, participates in the subject of the song because this beat is a really interesting one. It's this reversed beat, so it's this um, it's it's this beat played in reverse basically, uh, and it's looped and it has this really mangled saxophone sample over top of it. And what it is is this reversed beat is mirroring this theme of going home to the to the, some place in your past to revisiting the past. Um, and that mangling is representing getting caught within the ancestral web, basically getting caught up in this um, ancestry that is so associated with death and it is so linked to suffering and generational trauma. All of this, all of this in a two minute song, exactly two minutes. <laughs> you just can't like, <laughs> you just can't, I can't fathom how they were able, they, they just do this kind of thing. And, and churn this sort of thing out every year. Um, and this theme, uh, and again, another way in which the album is so beautifully structured is that this theme bleeds over into Billy's verse on the next track, Scaffold, which is another really strong song on the record, I think. Um, and this is a track in which uh, it has one line that stood out to me immediately, which is, ear apparent, I inherited a blood-stained throne for a seat. So what Billy's doing here is tying the legacy of inheriting pain and suffering, whether through specific family trauma, through generational trauma, or through like cultural trauma from your from slavery and, and et cetera. Um, and so it links this kind of family pain and suffering and death uh, into the processes of colonialism and the ways in which cultural issues are bandied about like weapons for certain people to wield uh, for their own interests. And specifically, um, Billy actually gives a really eloquent verse on the topic of cancellation, um, which I think is something that, I've, first, first of all, I've heard very few rappers attempt to try and uh, interrogate. I mean, the only one that comes to mind is fucking Skepta. And let's just say that wasn't necessarily the densest um, uh, Skepta and Slow Ties song, which I enjoy, incidentally. I think it's a good song, but it wasn't exactly a dense and interesting uh, and thoughtful interrogation of cancellation. But this song, uh, with, well, at least what Billy Woods is getting at in this song is, um, what he does is he goes, what makes it so interesting, is he goes beyond questions of right versus wrong and questions of punishment versus crime in terms of cancellation to examine more deeply the ways in which accusations force people who are both involved and not involved, particularly not involved, to take sides. And the playing out of personal dramas on social medias leading to inevitably the ugliness of each individual's more personal and selfish motivations bubbling to the surface. Like for instance, um, 
you know, when someone gets cancelled and then someone, you'll see someone on Twitter instantly going, oh, I always had a bad vibe about them or I never liked their music and stuff and take that opportunity to kind of gloat about how they're above it. That's the kind of, that's an emblematic little piece of, of, of what Billy's getting at that I see online all the time, but he, of course, is getting at it in a more broad and interesting way. Um, so what he does is he, he, he looks at the individual's usage of this scenario for personal and selfish motivations and he circles that idea back to reflect on colonialism again and specifically the relationship between colonizers and the colonized and the ways in which either one or either either or both one's actions or beliefs are weaponized by others to engineer their destruction and he simply sees cancellation as one, manif one manifestation of that um, so he, he starts with this really specific subject which is um, cancellation and he kind of more broadly constructs a thesis about um, the relationship between groups more broadly and colonizers and the colonized um, and this is all within one verse um, before you even get into Elucid's verse on this song, which is even more esoteric and strange. Um, again, I, I, I have to actually apologize to Elucid because I really have not uh, not doing him as much justice as I'm doing Billy in this. And it's simply because he's such a, a difficult rapper to really understand. Um, but again, it's that, yeah, that, like that I bring it back we're, to like. Sorry. With the with, sorry, with the opening track on the record, for me, it's like with Billy Woods first, it's like dense, but I'm like immediately I have a general idea of what you're trying to do. With Elucid, it, it there's much more to connect and unpack, so there's less yeah. to immediately say about it. And again, it's it's more of that fractured poetry that Elucid uses. And I can mm. only really pick certain lines. Like he opens his verse on the song saying, Free fall, limbs flailing in the blackness, hundred hands slap, pardon self, sinkhole blast landed, earth mo earth mover, new gold standard. Uh, and there's another point on this verse where he says um, I believe in black secrecy plumbed to the death where language drowns in the thick of spirit, bodies humbly collapse, fetal eye of a thousand needles. I can't tell you what that means, but I know that it's fucking baller. Um, <laughs> that's really it. So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about how I don't understand something because I know that's not very interesting to listen to, but I do think that Elucid's particular style of poetry deserves a shout out, even if I can't do it justice. Um, then you get to, uh, I think, a string of songs where the record really hits some of its most pointed moments and, and really hits its stride, honestly. I think, as we've kind of discussed, the production perhaps gets less immediately fascinating and interesting in the back half of the record, but I think that's appropriate because it, we get more conceptually heady with some of these songs as well. Um, Falling Out of the Sky, I think, is uh, maybe the most immediate track on the album. Um, certainly one that the first listen to this album immediately kind of jumped out at me and as something that I really enjoyed, even without knowing what it was about. Uh, Earl, as Earl's, Earl's verse has already been alluded to um, by August. You, Earl, um, August has already kind of summed the song up beautifully, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But I want to draw attention to a few lines. Um, Earl's verse is really short, but I think is really potent and has a, a nice display of everything that makes him great he is immediately noticeable even though he has a kind of similar voice and his voice fits in perfectly with these other two rappers he's really noticeable when he shows up because his flow is so different um he has he's he raps much more slowly and, and much more measured and he gives much more emphasis to each individual word which is one of the great qualities of earl and i love i really looking forward to the point in which we i know we're going to be talking about some rap songs in the future on this podcast and that'll be a really great uh, excuse for me to go into why i find earl's performance style so fucking brilliant but he's great on this song. Um, he has a really great verse about grief. And what I like about it is that it directly mirrors Billy's verse about grieving um, in Indian summer. He talks about death in a family context first, and then he expands it to the hip hop world. And my favorite line, maybe my favorite, it's not even a line, it's half a line. It's my favorite kind of phrase on this entire album is here. And it is, um, the black sky is full of supernovas. Uh, and when I kind of heard this and focused in on it, I was kind of awestruck by it. 
it's a it's a beautifully evocative image for one like even without trying to think about what it means it's immediately striking um and he also um talks about stars falling out of the sky as well towards the end of his verse and he makes a reference to kobe bryant specifically but this black sky is full of supernovas line um specifically the context is gives more meaning to it which is sometimes we collide the black sky full of supernovas the stars that died no lie i'm still rooting for us and what he's talking about here is he's talking about the death of uh, rappers, basically, uh, the death of stars, the ways in which um, people, celebrities, um, icons in the world of hip hop um, become symbols of tragedy. Uh, it's worth noting and something that the um, that the genius annotation brought to my attention is that Earl actually produced a song for Mac Miller shortly before Mac Miller passed away. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was playing on Earl's mind when writing about this, even though he's alluding specifically, I think, to black stars in particular. I think that there's more allusions to the hip hop world generally. So I think that's a fair uh, uh, thing to evoke. But it, it's such a beautiful line. Um, and it's so moving in a way that Earl, people don't necessarily think of Earl as this like really uh, emotive and moving rapper. They think of him in terms of his cold sort of nihilism at certain points, but he can really, really get you. Um, deep down also worth mentioning as well is that this is kind of a full circle moment as well because the alchemist did production on earl's debut record doris as well so a bit of a full circle moment there uh and then um yeah that's just a great song then you get into wishing bad uh which is a, a, a an, an, another really sensational track um this song is about the prison system uh, and it draws attention, it draws references to Foucault specifically, um, which is obviously the writer in terms of um, interrogating the prison system and, you know, more broadly the ways in which um, the manners in which prisons operate are reflective of very specific societally engineered um, differentiations and stuff um but this is a really great song that again is really pointed about this there's a particular couplet from billy here that i want to draw your attention to a thousand plateaus a constellation of prisons and an ocean of archipelagos an algorithm so a thousand plateaus is specifically a reference to a book i haven't read but it's a seminal kind of uh, philosophical book uh by um Gilles Deleu and Felix Guitari, I probably butchered your names. Um, and, and so that's a, a, a classic philosophic philosophy book that is evoked that specifically um, is, I believe, uh, related to these ideas of um, barriers and um, constructed imprisonment um, in society. Uh, and then you have a constellation of prisons, which links um, this, these kinds of social barriers that Deleur and Guattari talk about in A Thousand Pl Plateaus to prisons directly. And then you have an ocean of archipelagos as the next part, which links these two things, so social barriers and actual physical prisons to um, actual uh, distinctions between countries and distinctions between islands, distinction between different parts of the world. So basically you've got a social distinction within a particular American system and then the ways in which that um, th those distinctions are uh, of the West and you have these other parts of the world that are, that function differently, but also often similarly end up doing similar social things and enacting similar social barriers. And then the last part of this couplet is just the words an algorithm, um, which uh, it, it ties it again to the present, this idea that um, the ways in which we are all uh, subject to or at the whim of particular algorithms and things that dictate the ways in which um, people in power want us to live our lives, want us to consume, want us to construct the reality that they're envisioning, the barriers that they want, we now construct um, through the for them and we construct in part by this world we live in now in which we give them so much personal information uh voluntarily um so i think even this couplet which i don't even know if my interpretation makes any sense of it but even this couplet has a world of significance and a world of depth to it in terms of some of the 
socio-political interests of Billy and of Elucid that I could be talking about it for an hour and still not fully unpack it. Um, but basically, I, I hope that at least gives you enough to tell that there's a lot more here than maybe even meets the eye within a couple of lines. Um, so it's a great song. And then uh, my favorite song on the album uh, is the song that follows it, which is Chitaronis, uh, which uh, expands from the prison system analysis to a consideration of the police state. But this, I think, is really a track worth zeroing in on because it's much more manifold and it's much more layered than your typical fuck the police music. Um, it, go, it, it has, it's much like that track, um, Scaffolds, which has this really, um, or what's the track I specifically talked about? There was one track I specifically talked about where it was like Billy examined culpability in terms of a victim perpetrator narrative from different perspectives. He's done that a couple of points on the record and he does it again, or not necessarily in the same way, but he has a similar kind of perspective, considerate uh, approach to this topic of the police state uh, and the way it's understood in Chitaronis. So, um, the line that immediately jumps out in this song, I think a line that Sersh has already mentioned, is the line, you gotta kill the cop in your thoughts. And so what Billy is drawing attention to here is, yes, while it is very important to oppose the police and specifically the police state, um, I think Billy is much less interested in the police as a uh, organization than the wider state as a system that that is just a small part of. But um, but yeah, this line of you got to kill the cop in your thoughts is Billy communicating that it's, while yes, it is important to oppose the police state and yes, it is important to um, be enacting serious action against it and in, in, in opposition of it, you have to prioritize uh, the ways in which you have to think just as much about the ways in which um, the tenets of the police state or the idea of of what the police do manifest in your own mind and in your own interpersonal interactions. So there's a point, um, there's a line where he says, Negroes say they hate the cops, but the minute something off, they want to use force. And that's a really pointed line because it's like, yes, it comments on the ways in which um, anti-police culture is such a, uh, an integral part of uh, hip hop and rap music because it is such a uh, integral part of the narrative of African-American history there's also sometimes a sense of hypocrisy uh, where you will have people doing that uh, and then also advocating for uh, violence or, or not necessarily even just violence, but like um, thinking about other people and thinking about the ways in which you deal with the world in a way that's inarguably informed by the police day and is even feeding into it and reinforcing it in a way that is not intended. So this is a really interesting point that um, Billy brings up that I think is really worth noting. Um, and um, yeah, and obviously there's um, one thing that I'm surprised that no one has brought up yet um, is that this song has a really dope feature from Quelle Chris, who um, I think I said some really nice things about Earl's feature before, but I think that Quelle's feature is the best feature on this album. I was really, uh, I shouldn't necessarily have been surprised because he's very talented, but I was really surprised at how Quelle really brought the heat in terms of his performance, but also managed to bring a verse that was just as dense and interesting and layered as what Billy and Elucid are doing. Uh, in fact, I would even go as far as to say that Quelle's contribution to this record is one of the standout verses of the whole album. Um, he kicks off um, with this great line, uh, if you off the pig, is you often pigs or often figs? So it's this idea of if you are, um, you know, if you're in opposite, if you're living and existing and speaking in opposition to the police, how is that actually manifesting? Are you acting in a way that is, um, you know, reacting against that actual organization? Are you engaging in actual action or are you trying to offer an olive branch are you trying to heal are you trying to be violent or are you trying to heal are you, how are you actually quelle's got you trying to wants uh, people to think about how they're actually performing their protest and whether it, what actually what they're doing is whether it's actually useful or not 
uh, and whether it's actually what they really mean or whether it's performative, because he, the next line he says, oh, you're big and bad, blowing hay and sticks, huff and bricks. Again, alluding to the Three Little Pigs story, another little in wordplay incorporation of the pig comparison. Um, and, and so he's really getting digging into this theme further of what it actually means to oppose the police, uh, what it actually means to uh, stand in opposition to the police state. What are you actually doing? And what is the actual meaning of what you're doing? And what do you expect the end result to be and why? Um, Quelle in his verse also has another really great line that gets at something that's actually bugs me a lot about Twitter. Um, it manifests on Twitter and, and not just on Twitter, but in other places. He has this line, uh, we let BLM be the new FUBU. If you be you, of course, referring to the for us by us sportswear um, movement um, that was very fashionable in the '90s, but eventually has kind of become come to be seen as a bit outdated and um, purely symbolic in a way that feels fake. Um, and and what Quelle is doing is he's drawing a comparison between how he perceives the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, is being uh, operationalized and used in society as as like a passing fad. People are treating it like a fad, essentially. Well, j just to add some flavor to that, I don't know, I probably doesn't know or care, but to add some flavor to that, that's a big discussion in the UK at the moment because um, in our football, soccer, football league, uh, the British Premier League, at the beginning of every match, uh, sort of homaging what uh, Kaepernick did in America. You're meant to sort of take a knee to demonstrate there is no room for racism in football. And there's this very prominent um, black footballer called Wilfred Saha, who um, was going to be a big thing. He's still kind of a big thing. Uh, but um, basically, he said in the national newspaper, he is refusing to take part in taking the knee because he views it more as a performance that people do to appear like they're towing the line yeah. and less like they're actually making a solid protest. And that I think that's a really, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really good example of it. I think what Quelle is getting at here is that when, Ka when Kaepernick took the knee, that was meaningful, that was bold, that was something that had an impact, but mm -hmm. it's something that's meant to trigger change it's something that's meant to have people thinking about what are they doing to oppose these things that Kaepernick is opposing but what people did instead was they just said oh okay so the way to oppose is to take a knee like that's what we do now that's how we protest because Cap's done it and it's had this big effect so now we have this script for what we are what we have to do to show that we are you know pro yeah. black lives and etc mm -hmm. and so Quelle sees BLM as being um, the, the movement more, more widely, but I think it's pointed that he sees BLM instead of Black Lives Matter. He sees this particular symbol. Yeah, it's, and, it's like a hashtag, yeah. Yeah, exactly. People put it in their Twitter bios all the time. Mm. And they, yeah, exactly. And it's like people just put it there to posture, basically. Mm -hmm. They might, of course, they might genuinely believe that, you know, in, in the core ideas on a very basic level, but people don't, mm -hmm. People don't go beyond that. People use it mainly as a kind of status symbol and mainly as a way to say, hey, I'm actually one of the good white people because I put the BLM mm. thing in my bio. So that's how you know. <laughs> so that's yeah. what Quelle I would have voted for Obama three times. <laughs> that's what Quelle is getting at in this verse. And it's so pointed and awesome. And, um, and, and again, if you want, because we obviously can't speak about how moving we find it as black people because we aren't mm -hmm. we can see again a parallel to this sort of thing happening in the trans rights movements as well you yes know, people say yes. stuff like yeah trans rights human rights and all that sort of yep great awesome so yep. true king queen mm -hmm. whatever but like it's the same it's Monarch. the same thing <laughs> it's like obama not obama like joe biden making trans visibility day a national holiday the same week um states in america are banning giving health care to trans youths yeah yeah exactly so again those kind of parallels are all there you can find them if you want to that is those kinds of parallels existing and they're not they don't exist by accident the these this record is written in a specific way so that, that and can be clearly drawn as an analogy to all these different things that's what makes this more than just a great topical rap record and just a 
a great album in general mm. um um, so I, I, I'm, I've been going for so long. I promise I'm nearly done. Uh, Squeegee is a really <laughs> tragic song about self-destruction. Specifically, it's about um, a lapse into self-destruction from self, self-improvement. And um, there's the story that um, Billy tells of this guy who's ostensibly from the first person so it could be a reflection of himself who's constantly trying to improve himself physically and eventually ends up just becoming further and further distanced from the people around him by his fixation which i think is a really interesting story and this song uh and again this is something that i'm interested that no one else brought up maybe just didn't notice i didn't notice it until the third time i heard this record but this album this song ends with a direct sample of dialogue from the movie first reformed um which i think is an interesting evocation specifically the uh the line um are you a drinking man reverend no it doesn't help no i suppose not so it's that scene between um between ethan hawke and i forget the actor's name um early in the film uh and then that piece of dialogue as um august has already kind of mentioned um leads into the next track where it's finished with the b line from that movie can god forgive us for what we've done to this world the very first thing you hear in the song robert moses i don't even think i need to unpack that the connection that's being done there it's a great song again quite uh elliptical uh it's just one verse from billy um but i think it talks quite um about some of the kind of societal and institutional uh, and um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, gentrification of cities and that kind of thing as well. He really gets into it, stuff that's all kind of represented by Robert Moses without him having to be mentioned explicitly. And then you, okay, so the last song on this record, Stone Fruit. I think it's a really interesting closer. It's based around a sung hook from Elucid. Um, that I could see potentially not working for certain people, but I really fucking love it. It's a really good chorus. It has, I love the line, I don't want to lose control, but I can't cramp my space to grow, which is a beautiful sentiment. I think uh, it's not surprising to me that some people have connected with the song who's spoken already, because I think it is one of the most immediately impersonal songs on the record that's less, um, that kind of gives you that hook to kind of see the personal side of it. In a way that other songs don't. Um, uh, Elucid's verse is really like both Elucid and Billy go out with a bang on this record in their verses. Um, and I, I think I'm just gonna read Elucid's verse to give to do him justice because it's not particularly long. He says, "Chaos dissolves, distills what's true. I have so much more left to do. It never ends. Like light, I bend. I call for insight behind men." I walk through doors, my name's on no list, change is not for sure, a slow shift. Glacial tides, the tides are rising, got too high, dive in, I like wind, I really came in on a cyclone. Disciple, scribe the soul, scribe the scroll with my eyes closed, knives thrown, black Congo, blowing smoke, slapping conkers, there I go, there I go, flexibility, reciprocity, what I need, but you're not all I need, that's impossible. I think this is Elucid's most direct and easy to understand verse on this record. Um, he's basically talking about his sense of uh, having a, a job to do on the planet and having a gift in terms of his ability to write poems and words and raps and express certain ideas uh, in a very abstract way. Um, but he also uh, alludes to his own sort of sense of individuality and his own sense of personal significance. It's a very much a kind of, I, I'm great song, but not like in a, in a, you know, in a, in a selfish way, just in a, like a genuinely self-empowering way. Um, you're what I need, but you're not all I need. That's impossible. I don't have to rely on someone or something else to survive. I can sustain myself, which is a beautiful note for him to end the record on. And then Billy's verse, uh, is great. He references Byron uh, in the last line of his verse. He talks about um, uh, a figure drinking rosé out of a skull, but holding it gentle as my living head. Uh, this is a really interesting verse. Um, Billy alludes to this figure, this she, who is unnamed uh, in this verse. 
I think it's one of the only verses in the record where he kind of seems to be alluding to the specific other um, consistently with every single line. I'll just read the verse and then talk about it for a bit. Said okay to save face, but she never forgave. It's only so many ways you can say grace. In truth, she'd rather cry at your grave, all black regalia, we back not speaking, back behind bougainvillea. You can't peek in, marginalia, busy with symbols and equations. The story too simple to calculate it. Payment post dated. The pavement gave way to a thicket of thorns where the body lay naked as the day I was born. She rocked my teeth in her necklace, gold blood from a horn, ruby woo face in Mecca, hair disheveled and torn. She left what was left in a ditch. She dreamed of the sex she finished on top and howled in the crook of my neck. She dragged the bones home and built a bed. She drank rosé out the skull, but held it gentle as my living head. The, the thing about that verse is, I like say what you have to say, but I just want to say up front, that is one of the mo most perversely romantic verses I've ever fucking heard. And yes. I don't get it. Well, this is the thing. I've thought a lot about this verse because it's the last verse on the album. And I tried to think a lot about who she is. Um, and I feel like I've, I've kind of got it narrowed down to two things. And to me, it's either a personification of death or a personification of God. There's these references to religion, like Ruby Wu face and Necca is what uh, he calls her. Um, and, um, and she, and there's also a mention to saying grace as well, which evokes uh, religion, but there's also, I think, more references to death as well. Um, she'd rather cry at your grave than, um, forgive you, for instance, and, um, th th that kind of, uh, imagery evoked of, like, you know, drinking rosé out the skull, dragging the bones home, this kind of violent sexual imagery. And again, it's like, I think Billy's talked on a few moments on this record about death as the as a symbol of various things. We talked, I've talked about it in terms of um, his perception of the past, his perception of like looking backwards as a kind of dying. Um, and so I don't necessarily know what Billy is, if Billy is talking about death here, I don't necessarily know what he's trying to say, except that maybe that he feels completely entrapped in death um, is what I take away from this. Uh, and that I think is also emphasized by the way in which he ends this verse. I read the lines, but you really have to hear the song. His delivery gets so urgent towards the end of this verse. He's basically shouting uh, in that near deranged and almost scary tone that he has by the time he says those last few lines and then Elusive's hook comes back in to kind of ground the song. And it's a really frightening end to the album, despite the fact that there is this kind of beautiful and encouraging hook. Uh, I think it's one of the best songs that the duo have ever released. I think it's an amazing choice to end this record. And yeah, I, <laughs> sorry, I know it's not necessarily fun to listen to someone ramble on uh, barely articulately about dense uh, poetic uh, lyrics, but I don't know, this thing just, I think, I felt like I had to get this out um, because I spent so much time with this fucking thing and I feel like I am uncovering new, it's like a shape that I'm, that I see in two dimension, two dimensions, but I don't know actually how many sides it has because I'm only seeing it in two dimensions. And then the more I listen to it and the more that I read the lyrics and think about them, I start seeing more sides, the shape it starts becoming more three dimensional, but I still don't know quite how many sides the shape has. So I'm trying to see it from different angles constantly to try and get the fuller picture of it um, but I'm not quite there yet I think I'm maybe halfway there but um, as you've all said there's only so much that we can do with an album like this in the time that we have it before we review it so I think in a way I was upset that I hadn't fully unpacked it by the time we started recording today but now I'm kind of glad that I haven't unpacked it because I think I've kind of represented what the album is which is this thing that maybe can't ever be fully unlocked but that you will just every time you come back to it you'll occasionally see some new side some new angle some new meaning that makes it so much more than it was before and yeah that's it right well thank you for your really eloquent analysis i dug that very much yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. I, I, I feel like I have to apologize because I went on a fucking, I just, I just rambled, but 
yeah, I don't, <laughs> I need to work on, <laughs> I need to work on being more concise, I guess. But th- I, I feel like this yeah. is one of those albums where sometimes you kind of just have to go crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. But also your like contributions to like, I don't know, but, but like my discussions, I felt like your, your contributions really helped me bring out the okay. things I found interesting about the record when I was talking about it and just, you know, good job. Cool. Um, okay. Well, unless there's anything that anyone wants to add to anything that I said, um, then feel free to jump in and do that. But otherwise, well, I'm happy to wrap this up. We've got. To... I don't think I physically could, but... <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, if, if you do ever listen to this record again and and something jumps out at you uh, that we haven't talked about, then let me know, genuinely, please let me know because I would love to get more perspectives on this thing and try and understand it more. But if we're all happy, we can go into our favorite tracks and ratings uh, <laughs> after two days have passed. Um, um, Jake, what are your favorite tracks and, and least favorite track and rating for Harem? My three favorite tracks are Black Sunlight, Falling Out of the Sky, and Robert Moses. My least favorite track is Scaffolds, and my score is a 7 out of 10. Focus. Uh, three favorite tracks here are Sir Benny Miles, um, Falling Out of the Sky and Chicharrones. Least favorite is uh, God's Feet. I'll give this a seven and a half. Ooh, Morgan. Well, it's the same fucking thing that August just said. Uh, my three favorites are Falling Out of the Sky, Black Sunlight, and I will say Roaches Don't Fly. Least favorite, God's Feet, seven and a half out of ten. I so my rating is going to be slightly higher. <laughs> no, my Not favorite. No, oh, I'm sorry, but it's going to happen anyway. My favorite tracks are Sir Benny Miles, Falling Out of the Sky, and uh, Chicharronas. And I'm giving Ragged an eight and a half out of ten. Um, my three favorite tracks on the album are, uh, let me think about this for a second, Chicharones is my favorite, and then I'll throw in Stone Fruit and Black Sunlight, I had to pick only three. A least favorite track on the album, if I had to pick one, uh, yeah, it'd probably be God's Feet as well, even though I do like that track. Uh, and this album gets a nine from me. Okay, let's move on to the second album we're going to discuss today, which is... Godspeed, you Black Emperor, are a legendary post-rock collective um, that have been around since the late 90s. Um, everyone and their mum has heard of Godspeed, um, and they have become so significant in terms of the alternative music world of like post-rock and instrumental rock music that they're basically almost a meme at this point. Um, They are just so, uh, what's the word? They're everywhere in that kind of thing. Everyone who gets into instrumental rock music at some point gets told to or encounters the music of of Godspeed. They're They're prolific. Yeah. Uh, And they are interesting in the sense that they have those kind of soaring guitar sounds, but they also incorporate lots of orchestral instrumentation too. Um, Generally remains instrumental, though they do sometimes incorporate vocal samples as well into their, which makes it, gives their music an interesting quality. Don't do that on every record necessarily. They do do it on some, including some of their most well-known records. Everyone thinks Generally, people think most instantly of F, F sharp, A sharp, infinity, and lift your skinny fits like antennas to heaven. But um, they have been reasonably consistent uh, ever since then. And as any of us will tell you, some of us will tell you they've made some of their best work since then as well. Um, but yeah, there's really not much context to give. They're a very simple, straightforward band. They one thing I will say, I guess, in advance of my review, even though it comes up in my review, is that they are a very heavily kind of political band. They make uh, instrumental rock music in as much as they make political statements. 
um, but they try to do it in a way in which their politics and their message is suggested through sound rather than outright stated. Although if you read liner notes and album titles and, and all kinds of the ways in which their stuff is packaged, it's all over that sort of stuff. But um, it's interesting the ways in which it, it, it is all over that sort of stuff, but then kind of stays out of the music itself, except as a vague feeling. So that's, I guess, one thing that's worth establishing that feeds into this album. But yeah, other than that, I'll take a step back and, and who wants to talk about um, their experience with Godspeed uh, and how they approach this new record and what they think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I listen to all the Godspeed albums and uh, I like them all very much, uh, except for this one. Um, yeah, I, I find Sick. it impressive on like a musical construction level. I think it's very well put together and I think a lot of the baseline qualities it has are good uh that said it just does not do a goddamn thing for me um it's it's really it, it really gets off to a rocky start with me with those first three segments um which I, I now that i know that they're a bit more part of a movement makes sense and i really don't care for the movement frankly I, I find a lot of the instrumentation here to be very disappointingly sanitized. I think that it doesn't have near the texture, the grittiness, the just general atmosphere that I really, really like from this band that is present on basically all their other records, barring maybe I'd say Luciferian Towers, which is probably the most comparable to this album, which I think is a good record, probably overlooked by a lot of people. But it's it's that structure where it just sort of it, it it does build and build and it just kind of plateaus at a certain point and then doesn't really do anything. It ends just so unceremoniously. And I just kind of am left being like, well, that was fucking peculiar. OK, I you know, there's always these moments of tension build up release on these albums, uh, like on some of my more favorite ones, like Lift Your Skinny Fists. Um, and the, the crescendos and the, the peaks and valleys, they're, they're definitive. They have real like weight to them. There's like, it lets you kind of revel in the moment. And this either just lets the moment go on too long or the moment never comes at all. Um, I, where we break, how we shine, that kind of segment is a little bit more involving for me, uh, but the record doesn't really hit its stride with me until Fire at Static Valley, which I think is a very, very good song. Uh, like, actually, I, I'm probably underselling it. I think it's a pretty terrific track um, that wouldn't feel out of place on a few of their other records, honestly. I think that it's... Um, as textured as something I would like. It's a little bit more uh, morose. It's a little bit more moody, which is weird just because it's notably more down tempo than the things that came before it. But I find it way more engaging instrumentally on just like a pure raw density level. And just sort of the remainder of the record kind of continues in that vein, but it never really hits the high that Static Valley uh, just sort of presented to me. I was just like, okay, maybe we can get on now. And it's like, it's it's mostly pretty good from uh, then on out. Um, you know, I, I guess if I can afford it a compliment, it's that it's only 53 minutes long. So if this isn't a Godspeed album that you get along with terrifically, like I don't really, um, it, it doesn't really like last horrifically long. It's, it's not going to be something that's like torturous to listen to. Like I would, I'd say this is a good album but divorced from context, it's just not something I have interest in listening to again, just because I've clearly, I had limited mileage with it when I began listening to it and I have wring that cloth dry re-listening to it. It's just like, all right, I've, I've got it. Um, I, I, I think what, uh, our side has to win um, is probably the notable upturn from the record, I guess, from Fire at Static Valley. It's a bit more of a satisfying way to, to end everything, but I don't know. Th this was honestly just a bit of a disappointment for me, just because I, you know, not, not that I'm like, you know, huge into their super, super later stuff, uh, and I didn't have any expectations for what I like wanted out of this specifically, but in terms of just like a post-rock experience, this just felt incredibly turgid to me and it didn't yield many benefits. It just felt so 
kind of rigid and, and angular and, and I just was like, you know, maybe listening to the other Godspeed albums beforehand set me up for disappointment and especially how much I like some of them. But I don't know, like even if this wasn't a Godspeed album, it, actually, no, I take that back. In fact, if this wasn't a Godspeed album, I probably would have paid it even less attention. It's just, it, it's it's fairly innocuous to me. I, I feel bad in saying it just because it sounds like a really poor assessment of it, generally speaking. And it's like, there's a lot going on here than I, a lot more than I probably am giving it credit for. Uh, and, you know, I, I can see it working for other people if maybe you're just into those progressions and that sort of ascending more triumphant sound that's sort of continuing from Luciferian Towers. If that's just kind of more your speed, it's somewhere in between that and Asunder kind of sound wise, but it's still kind of enough of a departure to, to feel different. It's just different in ways I, I don't really get along with. So it, it's mostly just a flat line for me. I think you described okay, I will that, take now. that well, <laughs> that feeling well, Jake, um, mm. even though I don't agree with you, I think that um, I completely understand how you'd feel that way. God, it sounded so, I genuinely mean that. I'm not trying to be, fuck, I'll just I, I assume. I assume, I assume better of you, Tyler, than to just to automatically think when you say something like, oh, what a cunt. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just, I just want to say that I realize it's not, this is not very easy music to talk about because it's no, like, not it doesn't in the necessarily. Slightest. I mean, I have plenty written down, but I don't think that generally speaking, it offers, you know, things that leap out at you in terms of things to describe. You either talk about it more broadly in the sense of how you react to it, or you talk about it specifically. And either way, you're kind of missing something because if you talk about it really specifically, you just end up describing what it sounds like and being didactic. And then if you describe how you react to it, you're inevitably going to descend into my musings of. Blah 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 well, plateaued. You, you can look forward to my review then, in which I try to balance right, yeah. both of those two ways of describing yeah. post rock. <laughs> ah. Anyway, Morgan. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that as a jumping point because I largely agree with what he said. Although I, I admittedly I do think I'm a little warmer on it than Jake seems to be. Um, I definitely agree with the sentiment of. Uh, this is obviously very musically proficient. Um, and you can you can tell that these are storied musicians who have been doing this for a long time. Uh, but as as a Godspeed outsider, the question in my mind was freaking frequently just like, "That's it," which is not fair. But it's also like, "That's it," in the sense that it just completely has evaporated from my memory if i'm frank um i did i gave it the the old james and t podcast do of two listens at minimum and i just uh, for the life of me i cannot remember much of anything from it except that i have in fact heard it twice um and this is evidenced by the fact that in the part of this episode that is cut i likened its uh structure to wish you were here, completely forgetting that the other 20 minute track is the third and not the fourth and final track on the album. Yep. So that was cool. Uh, well, yeah, I guess I'll just uh, get through my bit because really I'm not too far off from the general kind of consensus we've had so far i think the and i i should preface what i'm going to say is that i'm kind of breaking this down not into the broader pieces but more the individual uh movements themselves because that's how i've always experienced godspeed's music that's been for me the best way to intellectualize and break it down so it opens with of course uh military alphabet all five eyes blind which i thought was a very classic feeling track for godspeed it's radio static coupled with field recordings and eventually uh, you get the sound of horns cutting through all of this and what I thought was a very beautiful intro to the record itself. Uh, 
I mean, from out of the gate, it has a distinctly more triumphant sound than a lot of the classic era Godspeed stuff, where that is much more doomy and apocalyptic. This is certainly more uplifting purely on a on a sonic level. I mean, I did enjoy I did enjoy a bit of the crunchier sound this album had across it. I thought that aspect of the production and recording of the record was at least particularly enjoyable, particularly the crunchiness of the horns on that first track. I thought that sounded just gorgeous. I loved that sound in particular. And some of the guitar stuff on the next uh, movement, Job's Lament, I thought was a really, really sounded good. And, and then the way uh, Last of the Glaciers moves away from that sound. But I think Jake did a great point at capturing what particularly is so uh, unappealing with Glaciers. This, the first kind of broader track in that it's not, par it doesn't particularly take you anywhere too dynamic, too far outside of the fence for Godspeed. It feels almost standard, typical, like they're just doing the same shtick over and over again. And uh, then we get Fire at Static Valley, which represents this kind of briefer break between the two larger pieces on here. And uh, this, this track also struck me as feeling just typical and lacking a lot of satisfaction that I find I can so easily derive from a lot of my favorite Godspeed songs and records like uh, there's and perhaps it's unfair to compare this to like like to just directly compare it to some of the group's greatest material because this is obviously because obviously I don't want them to just be a static band that never never evolves never goes anywhere but there's never a moment on this record that's as epic or as dynamic as like a world police and friendly fire where that's one of the most breathtaking crescendos they've ever put to music and here they seem to almost lack a certain ambition they had uh they had in years prior and I mean, once again, maybe that's on me for not, for just kind of wanting something similar, but it could, but I think I can also place a bit of the burden of that on the band themselves for not creating any piece that, that forged a new direction for me that was, that was interesting enough to really hold my attention in that way. Although I will say, Government Came delivers a more compelling track, I think, the swelling, fluctuating sense of urgency presented on this song did evoke some excitement from me. And I thought it was a very engaging listen. And Cliff's gaze follows up with this typical Godspeed crescendo that while still, while, yeah, as I've made the point of, uh, whatever, uh, I thought it was still a nice piece to have on here. Ultimately, I do prefer Cliffs far more to Glaciers, uh, ironic. Uh, so the album caps off, of course, with the uh, Our Side Has to Win. I thought a particularly beautiful ray of hope at the end of this record. It was this very nice sounding song. It went in some fun directions. But yeah, ultimately, while the performances and everything here across the board is very tight, I feel that at State's End is consistently just lacking something. It's, it's a little hard to put into words, but it, it feels like there's like a voice at State's End lacks when I hear it. There's some urgency it doesn't, it doesn't have for me. But ultimately, thing is... I still like this album. I think it's still a good ex like 53 minute experience. It being not too long, I think does make for a nice brisk listen. I think it's still got some really great cohesive parts. I mean, a good, 
half of this record I think is really good. The issue being that I just have other records in their catalog I can go back and listen to that will give me the same experience but better and more fulfilling. And that's about what I have to say. Um, so yeah, this puts me in an interesting position. Uh, I often say on this podcast how much I love to give counterpoint. And I do. I really enjoy giving counterpoint because to me, I think that's the notion of counterpoint is one of the things that makes our podcast the most interesting. And it's edit, often at its most interesting when we are engaging in uh, differences of opinion, which is not to say that we are interesting when we all agree. That brings out some of the most beautiful and heartfelt stuff when we have those moments where you're talking about records where you all love and it all comes out and it's all very lovely. Um, but I, I do enjoy when we disagree on stuff um, and, <laughs> and we do disagree because I love this album, but I'm in this curious position where I don't have a whole lot of substantive juice as to why I love this album in particular, but I do have some things to say and I do have an argument for why I think it works and, and why I, I enjoy it. But I think ultimately it is going to come down to simply a difference in personal preference, more so than any kind of grander meaning that I see in this album. Although I do see a very consistent evocation of a very consistent thing across the record that makes it, that holds it together for me that I'll get into. So Godspeed have had an interesting decade, an interesting career, but the last 10 years in particular, which I haven't been focused on necessarily because I think most people are more familiar and have spent more time with their classic era stuff, which is fair enough. But I think this has an interesting place in terms of the context of their post revival career in particular. Um, and the last 10 years of Godspeed's career have been an attempt to replicate the epic, epic and sweeping grandiosity of their live compositions, pieces which often hang and stretch onward for 20, 30, even 40 minutes. 2015's Eerie Asunder uh, took their lengthy live opus that was known as Behemoth and spread it across four continuous movements, building to a surreal and gigantic apex. It was essentially one song that was split into four parts. Um, 2017's Luciferian Towers was, in my opinion, uh, even better. Uh, I think at the time of its release, it was their most cohesive album release, uh, effectively continuous in a similar way, but better structured. So it opens with this gorgeous drone intro and then crests with the two major pieces in the track two and track four position. However, the strongest precedent for this new album, structurally anyway, is um, a, com or a combination of the sonic approaches of those two records with the way that the, their 2012 album, Alleluia, is constructed, which did the inverse of Luciferian and staggered the two main pieces in the track one and track three position with a supporting drone separating them and then as an epilogue to the album. At State's End essentially does the same thing, though aesthetically um, this structure is a bit lost on the streaming version which breaks up the two major pieces but essentially this is an album of four pieces um, two colossal and building ones and two more pensive and simplistic ones um, it's very different even though it's structurally identical to Alleluia it's very different in sound that's a much more metallic record than this one is this is a much more ethereally pretty one I think um, uh, where am I in my notes so yeah, it, it is, um, I, however, however, I do believe it to be the most unified and strong set that the band have released, certainly in their post-reunion period anyway. Uh, while there's nothing here that has the staggering doom metal atmospherics of the pummeling Mladic on Alleluia, or the trudging grandeur of Peasantry on Asunder, or the uncomplicated triumphant swirl of Luciferian Towers highlight bosses hang. What At State's End has that those records don't, with the exception of Luciferian, although I think that record ultimately falls short of this one purely for production related reasons. But what this record has that those don't is the sense that Godspeed have unified the basic elements of what makes their music great in a matter that feels more singular, soaring, and emotionally resonant than it has been in nearly two decades. This is not an album in which various 
sections um, highlight certain aspects of their music and then give way to different sections which highlight different aspects. This feels like a unified um, all at once sort of thing where everyone is in perfect synchrony in a way that they haven't quite been for a while. And I think is quite, to me anyway, is very satisfying. Um, the stellar glacier has the slower build of the two major pieces here. But by the time it's slowly ascending melodic loops burst open into these soaring arpeggiated melodic lines halfway through, to me, the band sound both clearer, but also more raw than ever before. I really like the production here. I think it has a real edge to it and a grit that has been missing from the last two records specifically. Alleluia had that too, but the rawness in that record stuck out from the prettiness in a way that sometimes felt jarring between the heavier moments and the lighter moments. Here, it feels like every sound, and I mean every guitar tone, every violin and cello tone, every booming drum and creeping bass tone, has been constructed and arranged meticulously in the mix to work with synergy in a way that gives utmost priority to the thing that Godspeed's music has always been about, inspiring emotion. And I can definitely see how the synergy, the synergistic aspect of the playing here, the, the all at once attitude, could result in something that feels, um, what's the word I had in my head that I'm looking for, could result in something that feels monotonous to some potentially. I can definitely understand it having that effect. Um, and I'll tr it simply didn't for me, and I'll try and explain what I get in, out of the music. But it is a particular stylistic choice with this record to have this approach that's much more again all at once and i can definitely see how it makes a record that perhaps doesn't have the immediate standout quality in terms of the highlight moments that their other records have it's a record that's much more headier in terms of the sound and, and that i just enjoy less for the awe, mo awe inspiring moments than just the general consistent feeling it gives me um where am i um, and the inspiring emotion of this album is not just emotion as this intangible and floaty concept of feeling, but as a visceral gut punch that calls you to arms, that inspires you to action. The band have always been unabashed revolutionaries, and, I, and they've placed their revolutionary politics at the forefront of their music, and in particular their aesthetics and presentation, which I've talked about, rather than imbuing those within the content of the album, Godspeed see the triteness of having some figure literally spell out their message on top of the wailing guitars and orchestra. Their goal has always been to give you enough information within the context of the music, the strange titles which feel like mangled post-apocalyptic remnants of some manifesto that led to an uprising. These titles are just the dressing which prime you and prime the way that you are to receive the music and the images that you're to project onto it. So the context and the aesthetics prime you to some degree and then the sound itself fills in the rest of the gaps. Um, though Glacier is a simple piece for the 20 minutes that it spends crafting the soundscape and trying to evoke both the passion needed to inspire a call to arms and also to serve as the soundtrack to the battle that follows, the simplicity is the sweetness for me. It, it, to me it's not ponderous, it's focused. But I do think it's interesting how you can have this dichotomy of experiencing it either way, despite those things being completely opposite descriptions of this song. Uh, my argument is from this opening, everything on the record builds from it to continue this evocation of an apocalyptic uprising, a rejection of the state and its unification with corrupted religious dogma, which I think is what the album's title is about obviously uprising against the state, but also rejecting um, doctrine. Um, if we're considering context thoroughly, we might also want to pay ear time to the additional subtext of things like the climate crisis, which has underpinned many Godspeed records, the nuclear weapons crisis, which has arguably been either subtext or text for every Godspeed record, and in the current time, which in when this record was recorded, the pandemic crisis as well. All of these are not necessarily things the band are trying to make statements about with this record, but they, I think, are unavoidable pieces of extraneous information that inform it and that the music reflects in tone. Um, though this is supposedly music for an, a revolutionary uprising, if we were to follow the title, uh, it's also more somber and measured 
for the most part, com compared to the blazing triumphantness of the last album. Uh, Fire at Static Valley is eerie and unsettling string drone that feels like one of their most finessed and detailed drones to me. And they've done few, uh, quite a few drones in the past. And to me, their drones have always been sort of one of the weaker and less interesting elements of the music. But I find the real crispness and resonance of the string sounds and the drone pieces on this album to be really clear and really sharp and really emotional. Uh, and that feels like they have finally understood how to make their drones work. Um, and it, it also demonstrates nicely the ways in which while this album is structured the same as Alleluia, the drones feel more purposeful than they did on that album. Uh, where on that album they were nice, but they were more like kind of breathers in between the heaviness of the main tracks. Whereas here it's like they're part of the tone that's being consistently um, evoked on the whole album. Uh, this I think is as an, an album that spends as much time lingering between the textbook soaring Godspeed riffs as it does letting those riffs steal center stage. And again, that's a balance they've tried to strike before, but I think they just managed to do it so much better here, especially than on some of their more recent records. Uh, Cliffs, the second major 20 minute piece is I think a fantastic extended climax that feels as though the call to arms of the first 20 minute piece and then the slow sort of trudge into war that I get out of the second piece, Fire at Static Valley, has realized some kind of awesome but horrific destruction, a kind of baptism by fire that the earth is kind of to be rebuilt from, stateless, as the title says, and liberated. I know that's all very, you know, much of a reach. Like I know that this music isn't really saying any of this stuff explicitly, but these are kind of the scenes and the images that I get out of listening to it. It feels like you're building towards this big battle that I think happens uh, or is signified by this the music of this song. Um, the climax of this track, the very last the very last few minutes of, of Cliffs, feels seriously cataclysmic. Uh, it doesn't reinvent the wheel. I'll, I'll gladly concede that. But it barrels forward regardless, and I think it feels really energetic and just really satisfying in a way that I really like. Um, but my favorite part of this album, uh, and I think the thing that really sets it apart from anything else the band have made, and I think a testament to this is the fact that maybe it's the one thing we all agree on to a certain extent, is that the closing drone, Our Side Has to Win, uh, is stunning. Um, it is both solemn and hopeful at the same time it feels like to me if we're continuing this thing of images in my head and this is the way i think about like idm as well and all tickers music i just think about it in terms of the images that it brings to my mind this track feels like the dawn of the first morning after that momentous battle that was happening in cliffs where you have a sun rising on fields of bodies and burning buildings and whatever remains is taking stock and letting out this single huge cry of survival, which is what that string drone on the song sounds like to me, a cry of survival. Um, and what I like most is that any of the socio-political or environmental readings you want to take to the way this record sounds, um, you can fit to this broad emotional arc, uh, I think. Um, whether it's climate change may have undone humanity, but then you have the first day after the last people have died and the sun is still rising. Um, all of that sort of stuff, I think you can layer onto the sound of this music. And yes, it's all very much projection, totally. I'm going off of some very, some extraneous contextual information that God's been given and what they've said their previous records are about. But I do think it maps neatly onto what they're trying to do here as well. That idea of post-apocalyptic, um, a battle for revolutionary freedom. Um, and I love this drone that ends the record. I kind of feel like if they never made another record, it would be a beautiful note to bow out on. Um, it feels like a logical conclusion to all the darkness and the suffering and the turmoil that their records have been soaked in. It's just a single, simple, hopeful sound that sustains. Um, and yeah, I definitely can't be mad at anyone for not necessarily getting into this record the nature of music like this is that it is so I think yeah it's just so you either get into it or you're not 
or you don't. There's, I'm sure there's a more eloquent way of putting that, but basically that's really where what it comes down to. I really found this compelling from start to finish, and I really liked the way that the band felt like they were synchronized um, in a way that was super fucking dope. <laughs> that's really it. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, that's all, that's all music really needs to be, super fucking dope. So, yeah. Music just needs to be a lot of really nice sounds. So, so here we are. I'm Guy Ritchie today. Do we want to go in the first order doing this album? You what? Well, I reckon what? we could you go in mug. reverse order. Sure. <laughs> um, so I think it's kind of... It... What are you afraid of? The Nazis? Sorry, that's a snatch. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, so favorite tracks and ratings. Uh, I'll go first. Um, obviously, we do three favorite tracks, but I think with a record like that, you kind of don't. You can kind of throw that rule out the window if you want to. Uh, my favorite. Thing my here, favorites. My favorites are these three. My least favorite is the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Um, yeah, my favorite thing here, as I said, is uh, our side yeah. has to win, and I think the whole of Cliffs as well is excellent. Um, and I definitely would would concede to a certain extent that Glacier, for instance, doesn't hit the way that Cliffs does. But I think that uh, the effect of Cliffs is greater for the way that Glacier and Fire build to it. So that's just me. Um, yeah, I, I really love this album. I'm giving this album a nine out of ten as well. Yeah. Um, so my favorite tracks are um, Glacier Flower. Um, there it is. Excuse me. <laughs> had, had a bit of Stella in me. It happens. My, my favorite. Now that's are, Australian. My favorite track is on Glacier Flower, Government Plates, and <laughs> um, <laughs> and our site has to win. Um, I'm also going to give this record an eight point five out of ten. You're also going to give this record a rating that it hasn't been given by anyone. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> as my last record. Yeah, okay. gotcha. you did. Gotcha. You said you did the same thing in your speech. You said I'm also going to give this a nine because you gave the last record a nine. <laughs> so mm. fucking hot in 4K. <laughs> so true. So true. I am going to go. So true. I'm going to go and put on my dunce hat right now. So <laughs> right. August, so get the fucker cap. <laughs> uh, uh, where is it? Oh, we got it. We oh. got it. Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah perfect we got it right. um morgan yeah i was just uh um i'm gonna i'm gonna give this a five and a half i lean a little more towards a six because i because I, I, I mostly i pretty much had nothing but positive feelings while listening to it but mm -hmm. uh it's just i i i failed to remember the album itself so you know there's that yeah i'll i'll just go ahead and skip the whole favorite tracks part whatever fuck it it's a six out of ten i thought it was all right okay uh i really liked fire static valley um six X out Stardew of ten valley yep oh, that's hey. the one uh, all right so that record gets a flat seven by all of us um, other records to get a flat seven are What's Your Pleasure by Jesse Ware. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Jake literally just having a fucking reenactment of that video. Uh, <laughs> much, more um, much more peaceful, actually. Mainly produced yeah. guitars! Okay, um, so let us know what you think of the albums we've discussed today, whether you think our takes are fair or not, whether you think we missed anything. I mean, obviously, we, if you have, do think we missed something significant with the uh, Arm & Hammer record specifically, please do let us know because I can't imagine how much stuff we didn't get to actually talk about. Um, but yeah, let us know what you think in the comments below. Uh, next week, we are, of course, going to be reviewing uh, the new Brockhampton album, Roadrunner, new light new machine uh we're also going to be reviewing a record that i have foisted onto our lineup <laughs> the new riley walker album course and fable which i'm not going to speak about any more than i did last week because i don't want to spoil anything i have to say next week but it's a good album i think it'll 
we'll have, hopefully have an interesting discussion. Um, yes. <laughs> All right. What, what are we reviewing for Record Club next so, week? Uh, well, Record Club this week that you, that, we, yeah, should, that we right, should mention oh, yeah. that you should go and watch if you haven't is going to be on Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells, a progressive rock classic. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be an interesting discussion as well. And next week's Record Club, I believe, is on is Morgan's Blue recommendation, lines. which is Blue Lines by Massive Attack. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. which recently yeah. celebrated its 30th anniversary. So that's going to be Woo-woo. awesome as well. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, as always, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Burger King, have it your way. <laughs> <laughs>